All right, well, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the Hopkinton School Board meeting for Thursday, January 21st, 2021. We have a full board with us tonight um, with Norm Guppel, Rob Nato, Andrea Folsom, Seth Aframe, um, Jim O'Brien, and uh, student rep Mia Richter disappeared. Hi, Mia. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Um, and we're also joined by Michelle Clark this evening and uh, Superintendent Steve Chamberlain. So thanks everyone. Um, and we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance and Steve promised a new, a, a new flag, I think. See, that's a flag with a new flag. See the new flag? Oh yeah. So this is what has been done in about 15 classrooms in the last couple of weeks. All right, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Steve, do you want to talk about the flooring again? You broke up a little bit, at least on my end. So this is a, a, a mad classroom of the middle high school that is, uh, has a new flooring down over the break, about 15 o'clock. This is why we need to Oh, oh, hey, hey, Steve, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I, I'm having trouble hearing you. I don't know if others are as well. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if your headphones are connected and close by you. How about and this? Is this better? Oh, there we go. We got you. Sorry about that. I've been a lot of, uh, a lot of Zooming today in each one. So um, thank you. The floor, um, about 15 classrooms have been done with this flooring uh, in district over the last couple of weeks. So this is a, uh, the eighth grade math classroom. Uh, and uh, we're excited to continue all the flooring. And, and um, so I thought I'd do an inside flag and show some flooring today. Nice, looks great. Um, all right, so uh, I'm trying to juggle. Forgive me for one second, everyone. I'm uh, screen, challenged, screen challenged at the moment. All right, there we go. Um, so we are here once again um, in, a, in a completely virtual meeting um, and we're able to do this uh, due to the governor's emergency declaration and uh, emergency orders around the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, those emergency orders have allowed for public bodies uh, such as the Hopkinton School Board to meet uh, completely remotely. So there is no um, physical location tonight, um, but we do, well, we are, um, making our meeting available for the public to view in real time on Zoom. Um, we provided call-in information um, for members of the public to be able to call and listen in to this meeting. Um, and then we're also um, are, have available two sessions for public comment, one towards the beginning of the meeting and one towards the end of the meeting um, where members of the public can provide comments to the board if they choose. And we'll explain how to do that as we get closer to that portion. Um, other than, uh, I, well, I guess I shouldn't say other than meeting um, remotely, but um, as we're meeting remotely, um, all the other requirements of RSA 91A, which is uh, New Hampshire's open meeting uh, law will be followed. Um, and that includes the minutes of the meeting will be available per the statute. Um, and then the only other change to a normal school board meeting that you'll observe is that each of our um, votes will be done in a roll call fashion. So it takes a little longer um, to get through, but um, we will comply with that requirement. Um, so Mr. Chamberlain, is there any uh, additions or deletions from the agenda tonight? We added the non-public minutes from uh, the, I think the 18th uh, Monday uh, as one more a minute to be approved tonight. Perfect. Um, and then, uh, is there any correspondence this evening? The, the correspondence received were placed in the correspondence folder provided to the board. Perfect. Um, so if anybody looked at the agenda this evening, they'll notice that we have um, a lot of minutes, um, both public and non-public um, minutes to approve. Um, and the reason for that, just so everybody knows, um, as I think everybody knows, uh, the, the school board has been in, um, working on a superintendent search. And so um, we, have spent um, some time um, conducting interviews um, with candidates and those are in non-public. And so, um, so anyway, so that's the, that's the reason for um, all these sets of minutes is the board um, has spent some Saturdays um, together. So with that, um, this may take a few minutes, and I apologize. 
Um, but is there a record? Um, is there a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to approve the minutes of the regular school board meeting held on January seventh, two thousand and twenty? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right. Um, Norm. Norm Couples, yes. Rob. Rob Nato, yes. Andrea. Andrea Folsom, yes. And Seth. S. A. Frame, yes. And Jim O'Brien is a yes. So those pass five zero. Is there a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to approve the minutes of the public portion of the additional board meeting held on January 9th, 2020? So moved. Second. Um, my only change would be that would be January 9th of 2021. Um, yeah, make sure we get the right year in there. Um, motion has been made and second. Is there any, um, any discussion? Good job, Jim. <laughs> all my checks are written the wrong way, but I, I found yeah. that one. Um, all right, so Norm. Norm Google the yes. Rob? Rob Nato, yes. Andrea? Andrea Folsom, yes. Seth? Seth A-Frame, yes. And Jim O'Brien is a yes, so those minutes are approved. Is there a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to approve the minutes of the non-public portion of the additional board meeting held on January 9th, 2021? So moved. Second. Any discussion on those? Norm? Norm Kupo, the yes. Rob? Rob Nato, yes. Andrea? Andrea Folsom, yes. Seth? Seth A. Frame, yes. And Jim O'Brien is a yes, so those minutes pass. Is there a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to approve the minutes of the additional board meeting held on January 16th, 2021? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Uh, Norm? Uh, Norm Kupo, the yes. Rob? Rob Nato, yes. Andrea. Andrea Folsom, yes. Seth. Seth A. Frame, yes. Jim O'Brien is a yes. Those minutes are approved. Is there a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to approve the minutes of the additional? I'm sorry. Is there a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to approve the minutes of the non-public portion of the additional board meeting held on January 16th, 2021? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Norm. Norm Kupo, the yes. Rob? Rob Nato, yes. Andrea? Andrea Folsom, yes. And Seth? Seth A. Frame, yes. And Jim O'Brien is a yes. Is there a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to approve the minutes of the additional board meeting held on January 18th, 2021? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Norm? Norm Kupo, the yes. Rob? Rob Nato, yes. Andrea? Andrea Folsom, yes. Seth? Seth A. Frame, yes. And Jim O'Brien is a yes. And finally, is there a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to approve the minutes of the non-public portion of the additional board meeting held on January 18th, 2021? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Norm? Norm, Norm Gupal is a yes. Rob? Rob Nato, yes. Andrea? Andrea Folsom, yes. Seth? Seth A-Frame, yes. And Jim O'Brien is a yes, and so those minutes are approved. Thank you, everybody, for um, <laughs> for being patient and bearing with us uh, through that. So this brings us to our first um, opportunity for public comment. As I mentioned, there's a second opportunity towards the end of the meeting. Um, and if you are a participant, you can um, or an attendee, you can move your cursor or your mouse down towards the bottom of your screen, and there should be a option to raise your hand. Um, if you click on that, that lets us know that you have a public um, comment that you'd like to make. And I would just ask if people would um, uh, just state their name and their address um, so we can record them in the minutes. Appreciate that. So first hand that is up is um, Aaron Vanderborn. Hi, Aaron. Hi, can you join us? Yes. Um, thanks, Jim. Um, Aaron Vandenborn. My address is 1017 Broad Cove Road. Um, first, I want to say thank you to the members of this board for their continued hard work and service during an incredibly challenging period. It can't be easy. And of course, I want to say thank you to the teachers who are doing a really great job in adapting to remote instruction and maintaining some sense of a school community for our kids. So I'm calling because I wanted to raise two items with the board that I think have probably received insufficient attention in recent meetings. First, I wanted to highlight the challenges of doing remote learning with the youngest students. And then second, I wanted to make the pretty obvious point that you know our kids are simply not getting enough instructional time. And by that, I mean literacy and numeracy instruction. 
and see what can be done to address this. So going back to my first point, um, we have a kindergartner and a second grader. I think that um, it's probably widely acknowledged that remote learning is really hard for kids at the youngest levels. Um, you know, these kids still need to learn skills like pencil grip that are extremely difficult to teach by video. You know, a lot of them are learning how to read. Uh, and, you know, this system that we're operating under now requires near constant parental oversight and involvement because, you know, most of these kids can't yet read. They can't be left alone with a computer in an open browser window. You know, there are a lot of activities that are games that require a partner, things like that, which is, you know, fun. But the fact of the matter is that many of us are juggling full-time jobs along with remote learning. So we're really struggling to fulfill our obligations everywhere. Um, and I guess I would also say that I, I recall that there was discussion back in the fall about taking steps to prioritize in-person instruction for the youngest students. And it just feels like that hasn't really happened. I, it kind of feels like the reverse is true and that Harold Martin students are getting even less in-person or live instructional time than the older students are, which is disappointing. So my second point was really that, you know, there's a lack of instructional time here, which is, you know, troubling. I think it's probably safe to assume that our students have received about half of the instructional time that they'd get in a normal year. And I, I think if that were the case for a single student, particularly in these really foundational early years, it would probably be the case that the school would be having some serious discussions with the student's parents about, you know, whether the student is off pace and possibly discussing repeating a year. Now we have a situation where all of our students are in that boat. And I, I haven't heard much discussion lately about how that lost ground is gonna be both measured and then made up. So I guess um, I would ask that the board or administrators address how we can measure those gaps and see what the plan is for getting them back where they need to be. Um, I know those are really big questions I think that the pressing issue is probably to just figure out how we can get more instructional time for these students. Um, I know we're going back to the hybrid model on February 1st. Unfortunately, I don't think that's really going to be the answer because, <laughs> frankly, I don't think they're getting enough literacy and numeracy, instru numeracy instruction under that model either. Um, but I guess I'd say when we do go back to the hybrid model, it seems imperative that we not lose any more days than we absolutely have to. Um, you know, I was disheartened by the recent decision to eliminate literacy and numeracy instruction on Fridays and replace that with a unified arts day. Um, I would really hope that we can leave the Chromebooks with families so we don't have to lose more valuable days when we inevitably have to transition from hybrid to remote again. Um, and so those are just kind of some preliminary thoughts. I don't know if the school's already thinking about that. Um, and I guess I would just close by saying, you know, we've heard a lot in recent meetings about the risks associated with not letting high school students play sports. And I would just like to hear more discussion about the risks associated with having students miss so much instructional time in these really early years. Erin, thank you for your comments. Um, really appreciate it. And we do have um, on the agenda tonight to, um, to hear from uh, the Steve, the superintendent about um, plans for going back to school um, on February 1st. Um, mm -hmm. And so that will be part of our discussion tonight, but I appreciate your points very much. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next hand that's been raised is uh, Jeremy Friedis. Good evening. Hi, Jim, this is Jeremy Freitas, 56 Old Henniker Road. Um, I thank you, Aaron, for speaking up. And it is, it is. I get the stress and I can hear it in your voice, the, the strain you're under. So just know you're not alone. Um, I agree with absolutely everything she just said. I think we need to reopen our schools now. This Petri dish of an experiment is failed. And um, I would go for full remote. So if you represent me, if any one of you actually does represent me, um, we would go full, excuse me, full back, full, full back to school. Sorry, thank you. Um, I think the kids need to be in-person learning with their, with their teachers. And I also echo the sentiment that maybe it can be successfully done at some degree for high schoolers, although supervision is a question, okay? You, you let me loose when I was a high schooler. I can tell you a couple of things I would have done that you don't want me to tell you on this call. But with a kindergartner, it is not 
it is not doable. You're putting parents in a, unacceptable. And I wanna just end by saying, I was on a call today with a client from New Zealand and we were just doing the nice catch-ups, right? And oh, well, we're in full remote. She said, you're doing full remote? Yep. And they said, well, we had five weeks and that's it. And we haven't done anything else since. It's amazing. It's just amazing how different, you know, and I was on another call earlier this week with a client in Georgia. They've been in school every single day this year, every single day. So from this constituent's household, we expect our children back in school. We're not asking, we expect our children back in school. So I hope you hear that. Thank you. Thank you very much for the comment. Um, I don't have any other hands raised at the time at this moment. Oh, we have one more. Um, all I have is Jen. So Jen, you're coming on over. Hi, this is Jen Blagriff. Um, and I was just calling um, and I know you, you guys hopefully got my email I sent earlier today. Um, so I just really want the school board and the administrators to really think about those kindergarten and first grade learners, especially the first graders who missed the end of their, the last third of their kindergarten year and are now in first grade missing a ton of school. And I agree with Erin that at best, we probably have gotten 50% of a school year, um, which is really sad for a kindergartner. Um, we do really need to look at the screen time limits put in place. The American Academy of Pediatric, they updated their limits in 2016. Um, and I believe that was, they got rid of the limits for five and up. Um, and plus those limits were not meant <laughs> for a pandemic with remote learning. Um, those limits were for kids sitting, watching Curious George and, um, other TV shows. Um, so um, the other point, since I always talk to you guys about reading, is that, you know, we need to give these kids more instruction in reading and math. Um, but for reading, we need, this district needs to put evidence-based reading instruction in place across the board. It's not acceptable anymore to be using a mix. It's well-established cognitive science that all, that all kids learn to read. Um, you know, in a certain way, and it just needs to be done. And this pandemic, if we don't make that leap now, um, these kids are gonna really, really suffer. Um, so anyway, I, I, I ask that, I really think it should be public that the data is analyzed um, and shared during a school board meeting. The elementary school uses star testing and other testing and that type of data can, you know, I'm sure you can, I'm not positive, but I would guess that you can get um, average scores across grades and be able to compare that to past years. Um, I really think that we need to look at it, you know, look at a really ordinary year, which would be 2018 to 2019. Um, and we need to figure out what the, the gaps are and how we're going to make up for it. And I can assure you that in reading, it is, it, if kids are given the proper instruction that, um, and for a proper amount of instruction that kids can catch up, they, it will not take two years for a student to catch up in reading that is in kindergarten and first grade. This is, I have two kids with dyslexia that you know, fell behind a ton and with proper instruction for the correct amount of time by great teachers in Hopkinton, they were able to catch up. Um, so, I mean, this it will not catch up completely, but do, you know, get, get, start the process of catching up pretty quickly. Um, so anyway, I just think that there needs to be a plan. It needs to be presented in public. We need to have conversations about this. Um, I understand that you guys might take offense to the point about, um, you might take offense to the point about, um, um, you know, the sports being talked about so much. But the fact of the matter is sports are talked about a ton on these school board meetings, a ton. And we, we don't hear conversation about academics and what's going on and what are we gonna do with all these kids that are falling behind and not getting taught. Um, so anyway, um, I don't know what else. And I don't know what else to say, but we're gonna end up, I mean, it's gonna cost this district tons of money to make up the time that these kids are missing. Um, and then, you know, if we're at a place where we can't afford to hire more people to help these kids, um, you know, 
I don't know why we're not getting more instruction. If it's because we don't have enough teachers, then we need to hire more teachers. And if we can afford to hire those teachers, then we need to think about extreme cuts. And I know no one in high school, no one with high school kids want to, wants to hear about cutting sports and AP classes and honors classes. But if that's where we are as a district, if we can't teach our kindergarten and first grade kids, then that needs to be an open discussion with the community. Um, and then I think that creative problem solving is definitely possible here. There can be small group instructions. There could be even on hybrid get days, you know, small groups of kids could potentially, you know, be going into school or doing small groups online with the reading specialists. So I, there just needs to, it just needs to be more open and transparent what is going on. And, um, and we just, the parents need to hear what you guys are thinking about, not just that we're getting half the education this year. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, appreciate your comments. So um, at this point, I don't have any other hands raised. And so we are going to um, close the public comment portion and uh, just know that there's an additional um, opportunity as we get further on in the agenda um, for public comment. So with that, uh, the next item on the agenda is comments from the school board. Um, so I don't know if anybody has comments they'd like to make tonight. Andrea's off mute, so I'm assuming she does. I do, yeah. So I wanted to, um, since we were, we're in a new year, I was doing some thinking and I realized, and it a little bit speaks to um, some things that were, were just said, there's a lot going on in our school district that we don't always know about. Um, they might not be talked about in a school board meeting. Um, you might not read it in your scoop or skim. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment to highlight just one aspect of our school that I think is going really well and to um, provide some gratitude. Um, now, gratitude is not the same as complacency. I think that we can both be really grateful for what's happening in our district um, and also continue striving forward. So I just wanted to take a couple minutes tonight to express gratitude to all of our counselors. Um, we have counselors at every single one of our schools. At Harold Martin, we have Jackie Kleiner, who often is the right-hand woman uh, to Bill Carosa. She knows a little bit about all of the students. She, if you have a kid or grandchild, um, or just know a kid at HMS, you've probably heard of Mrs. Kleiner popping in and providing social emotional lessons. Um, and she's really a resource and go-to. I know she works a lot uh, with Marie Wilson um, as well as Joe Montano to make up the behavioral support team. Um, so I wanted to give a, give a, a kudos to her. Um, at our MSS, um, our Maple Street School, we have Emily Squibb and Laura Alamo. And they also, you know, they're in this upper elementary transitioning kids off to middle school, which presents a new <laughs> different kind of challenges. Um, they've been doing weekly wellness videos. They do lessons in classrooms. They have resources in the scam and they also um, have been having daily check-ins and then meeting individually with students. Um, they also at Maple Street um, are lucky enough to have, um, that's where Dr. Alvin um, Caldwell is located and he's our school psychologist. He is also a great resource to teachers and staff and is always willing to, to listen to folks um, and to provide resources and supports. Um, at our biggest school, and so I wanted to give a, a shout out and thank you to the Maple Street team. At our middle high school, we have um, former folks there. We have Jeff Daly, and this is actually, he's the director of school counseling. This is his first year, but he's really done his best to go above and beyond meeting with students, providing advocacy for student needs, um, and doing some excellent relationship building. We also have Danielle Meserve, um, who has been quoted as truly a roll up your sleeves and do what it takes to help students find success kind of counselor. Um, and I think that that's something that's really appreciated right now. And then finally, we've got Beth Stern, who's working with our middle schoolers, um, which talk about a, a transition period of life. She really is there um, to provide both individual and group supports to help these kids find their voice um, and also you know, continue to develop their self-esteem. And then lastly, um, folks might remember that last year we talked about the importance of our SAP counselor. That's a student assistance program counselor and they can help attend to um, 
a few more serious issues, I would say, um, with students' mental, um, social, emotional well being. And April uh, Desroye, I don't know how to sp pronounce her last name, unfortunately. <laughs> It's a, it was a unique one, but she, this is her first year and what a year to, to walk into the school, but I was also got some great feedback on how she's worked really hard um, to really connect with students as much as she can. So I just wanted to express gratitude to the counseling services that we have at each one of our schools. I think this year in particular, um, we have needed and seen our counselors really step up to support our kids. Um, and I just wanted to publicly thank them. Thanks, Andrea. Rob? Yeah, so I just wanted to uh, think back to yesterday a little bit as I was watching the inauguration and listening to Amanda Gorman, uh, the National Youth Poet Laureate, do her poem, The Hill We Climb. Um, and I couldn't help but think about the Poetry Out Loud program at Hopkinton High School and the forensics tournament and all of the things that teachers do to help kids bring, bring them along in different ways to articulate um, in what turned out to be an amazing poem yesterday um, by that young lady. So, you know, schools provide a lot of different opportunities for kids and you know, it just made me think back to, to the good work that was done by the English department and continues to be done in, in that area. It was, it was a great poem. I agree. Um, it, was, it was just pretty amazing to watch. Um, and um, whatever whatever side of the political aisle you're on, just you know, that poem and sort of the emotions that it brought forward were pretty powerful. Um, it was great to watch. Thanks for bringing that up, Rob. Sure, I'll go real quick. I'm never quick, right? No, I just want to say thanks to Aaron, Jen, you know, and others for you know public comment. You know, we are going to unpack this tonight with Steve, and you know, one thing that passionate about being a parent is what we are always trying to look out for our our, our children and for other students in order to make sure that we're, we're meeting their needs. Um, there's a lot of questions that, you know, Steve's going to answer tonight, which, you know, I respect Steve and he knows what this community is looking for. Um, and I just want to say, you know, we're, as a parent, I'm very passionate about what I want for um, every student, you know, because I believe it's a very difficult time for all of them. And I understand that, um, at the younger grade, it's hard being remote. You know, we're not able to be able to relate to our teachers remotely and understand how to get there. But you know, I trust the schools are going to come up with a um, a recommendation or a way to get back in person. I just want the community to know that we hear it, we we see your emails, and that um, always feel free to speak how you feel. That's the most important thing. You know, we need to know. I think it's important, and I think this board does its best to work to work together. You know, regardless of the subject, you know, we have a job to do in order to bring us bring these children back. You know, yesterday, um, I have a daughter that's eight and a son that's 10, 16 year old. He's out of this. Um, four years ago, they really didn't know much about what an inauguration was. So it was, they couldn't comprehend what was happening. And this is not a political statement on whoever won or, or whatnot. It's about the moment for me as a father. You know, for them to be able to see their eyes light up seeing such a beautiful ceremony, regardless of who was getting sworn in, it was powerful for me. You know, my daughter didn't realize this was the first woman as vice president. She did not know that. And for that, it really brought, you know, tears to my eyes because of how our country has changed, you know, and for me, it was a proud moment to be able to be a part of history with my, um, with my child. So I thought, Everything, you know, what Rob said, um, the ceremony was just great to be able to educate my children in the moment, to share historical moments that um, they could comprehend and understand. And then they asked me how many presidents I was around for, and it, they thought it was like 40. And I'm like, you guys don't understand how it works. But, <laughs> they, they, but my, my point is, it was, it was a great moment. And um, I'm just, I'm very happy um, that we had a good ceremony on Jim's birthday. Happy birthday, Jim, that was yesterday. Turning 30 is tough. I'll make one more Amanda uh, Gorman comment. So I heard her interviewed um, late, sort of late at night on CNN and she was talking about um, profound speech pathology issues that she had through school and how special education and supports um, really encouraged her to overcome those 
as well as her effort. But, you know, it really made me think about how our special education services and encouraging kids to overcome the difficulties that they have and to deal with them and work on them really can uncover truly, you know, amazing, amazing things. So for all the teachers who, who help our kids in the areas that they, that they need the help, both special ed and otherwise, it was just an example. Because I was just shocked when someone who's so good at language talked about having a problem with speech. I just never would have thought of that. And um, it was really moving to hear how she, you know, people helped her overcome it. So thank you to everyone who does that good work in our schools. Thanks, Seth. Um, Mia, anything for public comment this evening? No, um, I'll just say a, a couple of things. And, and really it's, um, you know, we've received um, over the past I don't know, bunch of days, um, some really good and very well thought out um, emails from, from parents. And then we heard some comments this evening or along those same lines. Um, and I know we're gonna unpack this. So I don't, I don't wanna go and dwell too much on it. Um, but I, I just wanna make a couple of connections. And, and I think first, like I completely understand um, the frustrations I think many parents um, and community members feel. And I would just say, you know, from, from at least the actions that the board has taken since, um, you know, over the summer and into the fall, you know, what we've, what I think we've been working really hard to do with Steve and the leadership team and administration and teachers is to have as much um, in-person learning as we can. And, um, you know, through November, um, although there was, um, uh, it was challenging and we had a, a lot of um, on and off again because of cases of COVID in our schools. We really strove to, to keep that um, as much of the in-person learning as we could. Um, I don't want to repeat history, but we know that um, we had a, a lot of cases after the Thanksgiving break. Um, I think this board, uh, you know, as, as we've been discussing overall, sort of the risk management approach and the risk management approach that, that we agreed to as a board reluctantly and with the with administration was uh, to, to go into fully remote. Um, and I and I just speak for myself, you know, knowing what the limitations of that model was, which is why I think this board was trying to not go there um, throughout the school year. Um, and then as we've been talking about through, I, I think this whole crisis that we find ourselves in, um, you know, one of the limitations that we have um, uh, aside from space um, to bring students back 100% um, is just is staffing. And I, I know our superintendent has said um, since the beginning of this crisis that you know, staffing is gonna be one of our biggest challenges because um, if you don't have the staff to run and clean a, a school um, and, and provide a, a health and, healthy and safety environment, it's really hard. Um, if not impossible to bring your students back. And so um, that was part of our challenge that we didn't have the staff in, in order to, um, to fulfill our end of what, of what the district needs to do in order to provide health and safety. Um, and so, you know, here we are moving into February 1st, um, at least as, as, a, as one board member, I'm, I'm committed um, to doing what we can to um, bring as many students back into the school buildings as we can. I mean, that's been our position as a board and, and I, I'm pretty confident that's where we're gonna stay. Um, and knowing that in, in doing so and in, in keeping students um, in school is, uh, it's, it's gonna be challenging. Um, it's, you know, we heard from Dr. Fauci today um, that, you know, we're in the darkest time of this pandemic that, um, you know, there's, there's I guess, vaccinations on the way, um, but, you know, we're, we're not through it by far. And so as we welcome students and teachers and faculty and staff back into our buildings, um, you know, I'm doing it with eyes wide open that, um, you know, th hopefully there's, uh, there's light at the, at the end of this tunnel, but we're, we're not at the end of the tunnel. And so, um, so that's going to be a, a management piece that we're all going to have to work through. Um, and then, you know, there, there's been, I, I know some emails about, uh, you know, the part of our challenge here is the MOA that we have. Um, and that with vaccinations coming that we should, we should re-enter into negotiations on the MOA. Um, you know, the MOA is entered into um, knowing that um, if circumstances change, that that is an option, that we, that the, the option is there to go back to the table and have those discussions. And I appreciate that, um, you know, vaccinations and vaccines are starting. Um, but there's not a timeline. I, I think there's, you know, there's some phases the state has put out, but we're not, 
you know, there's no guarantee of when those vaccinations will occur for students, um, for, for teachers, I should say. And it is frustrating to see sort of the slow pace and in, in where teachers are put into the overall um, vaccination program. But I do think, you know, for everybody who's asked, I think when the time comes and, and we have some clarity that, you know, the MOA is a document that, um, that can and should be reopened if, if circumstances allow. Um, you know, this board has committed along with our teachers that we want to follow um, health and safety guidelines, which, you know, have been six foot separations, a lot of hygiene, um, washing of hands and surfaces um, and masks. And so um, I, at least as one board member, um, I haven't heard anything um, that, that would make me want to change sort of those fundamentals of our health and safety program at this time. Um, and that's sort of what's embedded in the, in the MOAs. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say, you know, for those who've been watching our meetings over the last, I feel like forever, but it's probably been a, a month or two, you know, we've been talking about our budget um, for next school year and, and the, you know, the, the, the drivers of those budget amounts and what it means. Um, in my, you know, reflection just on the conversations that we've had, I've had over the past couple of days. Um, and knowing that, you know, when we do go back to school, um, not only are there, you know, the academic issues that we're gonna face with, with um, children who are gonna need additional help in numeracy and math, those are real. And, and those are investments that we're gonna need to make in order to, to um, you know, ensure quality education. Um, but we know across the programs, there's, there's gonna be additional academic needs. There's gonna be additional, um, support needs in terms of emotional support um, for our students. And um, when I, so I, I, I say that knowing that's true um, and knowing that um, our administration and our teachers and our staff are thinking about that. And, you know, the budget that's put forward, um, uh, I, I think someone called it at some point, you know, a maintenance budget, that there's not a lot of big new things in this budget, that this budget is, is maintaining what we have maintaining the programs that we have, the, the support staff that we have. And, um, you know, there are drivers that are driving up some of our costs, which we don't have to get into now because we've been talking about it a lot. Um, but I just hope, you know, the community um, and, and parents, um, you know, appreciate that, you know, that additional support, um, there's a cost to it. And, and you know, our budget, if, if we start seeing, you know, reductions, um, you know, what's on, I didn't say what's on the table is, is the support, but you know, it, all this stuff has a cost. And my hope is that we can move through this budget cycle, retaining um, the core programs that we have, can, retaining the staff that we have, because I know we're gonna need it. Um, and we don't have crystal ball knowing what every single need is going to be. Um, but I can't pretend that we can go into um, a, a post pandemic educational structure with less resources that we had going um, through this year into it. And so I worry about that. Um, and so I'm, um, as I think about the year ahead, I, I just hope that we can, um, you know, we, we can get back to school, we can assess where, where we've lost, and then we can have the resources to deploy in a way that we can meet the needs of those students that we know are going to have additional needs um, from sort of this last, you know, what will be a year and a half of um, on again, off again, you know, challenging education um, programming. So that was been on my mind. I apologize for taking so long to put that out, but um, um, it, it helped me sort of think through all the feedback that we've been getting and sort of how we forge ahead and what our task is as a board. Um, so with that, um, we'll move on um, to our presentation and staff report and we have um, enrollment uh, with NASDAQ. And so um, Steve, I'll hand it over to you. Sure. I just, um thoughts as we working through the budget committee and working through with things like uh, what percentage of adequacy to support. Um, we did receive and we've, we've, get, we've received an uh, enrollment projection from the New England School Development Council and just a little bit of history. When I first got here, former superintendent Doug Brown and Schoolhouse Consulting did our projections for years and then um, Michelle did it. We did it in-house. She did some work and then when we went to the facility project, and we were close, we went through for a year, we were consolidating schools, and then we had some changes. We decided to, to commission NESDEC to do a study for us, just as those, that information was being more critical as we moved, and we've stayed with NESDEC ever since. And I'm just going to share my screen real quick. We've, we've seen in my um, time a significant change in the projection, and, and that's not a surprise, it's just a, it's just a significant change. So 
Um, we this was this is what we received in December. You know, we have the 902 and, and next year uh, an 895 and under 900 K through 12. And why K through 12? Because that's our adequacy receipt. And then if you go to what we were looking at, and even as in April of last year, we were at 991, 1000, all the way up to 1100. So uh, the reason I bring it to the attention, you know, we've spent some time, right? We started in the finance committee, looked at 95 to 100 or, or adequacy and 97 and a half. And, I did get a chance to call NESDEC uh, and talk with their consultants. And it made sense. If you remember, one of the things uh, Bill and I would look at with, with, with quite astonishment, we had a projection of 86 kindergartners. And uh, 80, we've never, we haven't seen in my 20 years in district, we haven't seen 86 kindergartners. But when you project 86 and bubble in the retention and growth all the way through, that's how you get to a big number in 10 years. But that 86 was reconfigured down to 48. And obviously it's such a small that we don't get the additional growth as we go through. So um, I do think we, we, you know, if the budget committee asks Norm about, you know, are we comfortable with the net with hundred percent? I think with the projection right now, I think the 97 and a half is about as aggressive as we can be. Um, they are, you know, we'll, 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 our plan and our hope is and what we believe is we're going to get returns from our homeschool and from our other situations as we get back to normalcy. And, NESDEC will adjust based on the return numbers, but I just wanted to make sure that the anomalies were shared, that you've seen the report, it goes up to the public and that information goes to Mr. Kupel as if, if there are any questions at the budget committee about changing the estimate for adequacy from 97 and a half anymore. That was really the goal um, uh, of this quick presentation, a little bit of history of enrollment, where we were last year in the spring, where we are now and what we expect if we get back to normal. Thanks, about that. that was yeah. just something to make sure that everybody was aware as we make decisions. So walk, walk, walk us through if we change it to 100%. Just we change it. We don't get that number. Walk me through with what happens with the additional funding. And then, it, and then, we, then the, the, the estimated um, tax rate increase isn't, you know, it, it, the tax rate goes up more than what we would anticipate. And that we think loses the credibility or faith in, in the budget process that Michelle and I and the board's gone through. So we, you know, we're, we do, certainly we try to be conservative in estimates because that number is, you know, a, a piece for people's planning and, and certainly their budgeting. We're not crazy conservative. Um, and I think 97 and a half is fair, but I just didn't want to have this information on the table when it maybe you understand why we don't want to go to 100%. No, coming out of a yeah, coming out of a global pandemic, you don't know what's going to happen. And exactly, and you have to play it safe and responsible. Yeah, I think that's well said. Thank you. Any questions about that? Anybody okay? Thank you, Steve. You bet. Thank you. I appreciate that time. And I just want. Um, uh, just to let everybody know that uh, Julia Shahadi, um, our, our second student rep, joined us. And so um, I didn't want to not announce that. So th welcome, Julia. Um, so next on the agenda is, um, is uh, the FY22 operating budget and warrant. And so I know, um, Steve, you have the first item here on the, the general fund budget value. Um, sure. You want to hop on that? Yeah, happy to walk you through. So, and this is uh, something that um, was presented to the budget committee in the last couple of meetings. So very, it was after, I think the next day after the board voted to adopt their general fund number, we received guidance from DRA, the Department of Revenue Administration on ha how to handle an expense coming from the maintenance trust, which we've done for years on the performance contract. So to, what we've had it as an expense and a revenue, and that meant we were spending a little more, but we had the revenue out of the trust to compensate for it. So that's how we had handled it and received it. But they changed the guidance to run it just out of the maintenance trust and not through the general fund and the revenue piece. So there's a the total general fund budget value has gone down $42,500. Um, so the new number, which is an accident item tonight, which has been presented to the budget committee, it is in all the materials for the budget committee. So this is just catching up to a really a, a, an administrative allocation of funds. The tax rate hasn't changed and, and, and nothing changed, is now 21,732,059. And that's a 3.8% increase to the budget side 
And that, of course, includes the increase of the bond, but that's the budget expense side. Um, so tonight codifies the DRA guidance about how to handle the expense from the maintenance trust for the performance contract. Everybody okay? Any, yeah, any questions for Steve on that? And everybody's ready for the action item um, on that number? Perfect. All right, uh, um, next up is the review of warrant. Sure, so um, as we've talked about throughout the process, we've been seeking guidance from our attorney, from the school boards association attorney, as well as DRA on how to handle a unique article. And the unique article is in response to the legislation of giving the district uh, the opportunity to go from two and a half retention for um, tax rate stabilization to 5% retention for tax rate stabilization. And, um, throughout this process, from the formation of the legislation through education for school officials through implementation, uh, at one point, the guidance was trying to create language that would say to withhold the fullest extent of the law, thereby the town wouldn't have to go back repeatedly to change any article or the school wouldn't have to go back to change the article. Uh, the updated uh, guidance from our attorney, from the school boards association attorney, as well as DRA is to keep it specific. And so the language now aligns with the statute of up to 5%. Um, and so that language has been codified. So just to adopt, that's, it's, it's, it's not a substantive change in principle, but it's a substantive change in language. So uh, tonight we'll adopt that. Michelle will make sure that, I think she's already done it, to align with the warrant that's with DRA in the system, which will be provided to the budget committee next week for their vote article by article. So this is, um, uh, just a change in language from what we hoped would be up to the fullest extent of the law to a specific 5%, which is in the statute. Um, any questions or comments received on that one? That one seems pretty straightforward. And everybody's ready for the action item. All right, perfect. And the last piece is, is just to make sure and, and um, the materials presented to the budget committee over the last two meetings, I know Mr. Cooper will be updating further down the agenda, are all on the website and certainly in, and have been provided with the to the board. The big, the, the last piece of the substantive materials, which I look at as the comprehensive all in document that I use throughout the school year repeatedly because it has the expense, it has the tax rate, it's got the CIP in it, it's got the fund balance in it, it's got all our trust values in it. It's got uh, area by area, FTEs, increases. So to me, it's the comprehensive document. Um, Michelle put that together and we wanted to make sure that the board had a copy. Uh, it was presented to the budget committee last night and as any changes from the budget committee go, we'll update it, that's on the website, but more just to bring awareness to the entire comprehensive budget picture for FY22. I muted myself. Thank you, Steve. Any questions on that? And and I just want to, um, you know, thank Michelle and Steve, um, but I, I think especially Michelle for all our hard work in compiling that document, putting it all together, keeping it updated. It's a lot of work. It's, um, and it's a great, it, it's 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 a great. Um, I don't say narrative because it's not quite a narrative, but it's 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 a, it's a wonderful document to find what um, you need in the budget. So thank you. You're welcome. We just keep rolling. Keep rolling. So the next piece. Um, is our a regular uh, of operating and learning in a global pandemic. Uh, so just a quick update on where we are with cases in our schools. Um, Harold Martins, and, and completely understandable, but the, the communication with the nurses in a full remote model or a substantially full remote model is much less than when obviously we're sending kids to school. Um, Harold Martin School has three students in quarantine, uh, one positive student in isolation and one staff member currently positive in isolation. Um, Maple Street had uh, two staff members came off uh, isolation, so they are um, a, a none currently are in isolation or quarantine. Um, the high school right now has uh, three students in quarantine who one is ill and is waiting for a PCR test just to see where they're at. So that's just the current piece. Um, regarding a sh just discussion about February 1st, um, just a, a little bit of the preface about the factors and um, so the, one of the driving factors in our decision to extend um, was our custodial, uh, our, our custodial ability and to fulfill 
you know, as, as you know, Rob was on when Primex said, it's important that we as a district, if we say we're going to do something, it's important that we do it. And we have set a cleaning standard and a documentation standard. Um, and so we have, as you look further down the agenda, a custodian coming tonight, and the hope is with the two weeks notice, we'll get us back pretty close or at least additional shifts around the February 1st. So that helps. One of our staff members who without our medical has, has returned on alternative duty and the alternative duty does include limited, but yes, there is some cleaning. So we help that. We have another um, uh, custodian that we hope to hear later on that will be returning who can continue. So our expectation is that with some overtime and possibly some substitutes, and I appreciate a couple of community members that are willing to come and we'll connect with them as well. We think we can maintain our cleaning standard and our, and our commitment to our MOAs and just good practice during a pandemic. So we think our custodian piece um, will be okay. And, and I should have said this from the beginning, talking with the nurses, talking with the leadership team and teachers, uh, we want to, you know, everybody wants to come back. We want to see kids in our schools again. Uh, absolutely, we've been out a long time and um, there has been some comments about the attrition, right? Of just this, the same thing, it's time. And so February 1st, we get our, our, are looking forward to kids in our schools again. The other piece, and it wasn't a major consideration, but it's something that we're monitoring is, and I showed the, the flooring right in the flag is to make sure that all the building work that was done through the holiday break through this extended remote time, the buildings are ready. That includes fire doors, that includes the elevator, that includes, if you've been in Maple, it's been great. They, they did the abatement. There's been a lot of equipment in the halls and um, we anticipate that being all set. And, and I think we're going to, uh, when we get down to the model, it's more specific discussion, in order to make sure that Maple Street is ready for February 1, that Friday before we're going to need a asynchronous day so teachers can come in and reset their classrooms ready for kids on Monday. So the custodians would think we're doing okay. The um, facility project would think we're doing okay. So I, as many of you know, I meet with our three nurses uh, every week. We, we review cases, we review our practices, we review, and all three um, really, it's important to come back to school. Um, they are encouraged by the positive cases, you know, the number of cases in Hopkinton going down, which is one of the one of the metrics that they're monitoring, and hospitalizations going down. Um, so those indications that those continue in that direction in the next two weeks, we think you know that will certainly support, uh, or at least getting to a safe return piece. So our nurses, our custodians, our building project. Um, we think are all get aligning in, in the score and the, the data aligning to return on February 1st. Um, so let's talk about the elementary. Um, so the elementary will be back February 1st in person in a hybrid team, you know, team A, team B. Um, in preparation for that though, Maple Street on the Friday before we'll need an asynchronous day so teachers can come in and get their classrooms ready after the building project and all that work. Um, and so we think that piece, um, the staff are getting ready. And we do, one of the questions earlier, and I talked to Matt Stone today, we were able to get about 155 Chromebooks earlier delivered. We think um, that, you know, we do have some more ability to have some in school ready to support and some outside. So we think that, that assets helped as well. One of the concerns uh, as we have an open discussion with the leadership team is we are in, you know, uh, we are in a tipping point status on our matrix. Right, our tipping point is anything more than 25. We are more than 25, and it, it looks like even at our current trajectory, it's going to take a while to get below 25. So when we're at the tipping point, um, you know, one um, one positive in a school closes the school for a couple of days, two positives in a school closes for five, and we get five or above, we close the district. And the concern is, especially because we've been out so much that if we do, if we follow the matrix, then we may be in on the first and then depending on scores, we could be out in three or four days and that in or out, though we have some technology to handle it, concerned about morale, concerned about consistency of practice and model. So what we've talked about with the nurses and talked about with the leadership team is, is trying to adjust so we can, we stay in as long as we can stay in. And so that's more of the model we did in the fall, even though we were at the tipping point, you know, we stayed in and when we had 13 staff member quarantine, we couldn't find, we went out and, and have a conditional um, alignment when the conditions weren't, we can't safely have school. 
but not close the district because we have three, you know, three cases at Maple and two at Harold. Because if there's no cases at the high school, then we want to continue to run the high school. That is a sea change, but we're trying to get as many days as we can. We're trying to avoid the in and out as rapidly as we can um, and, and try and communicate and contact trace, which our nurses are very, you know, are very competent at. And, what, and see if we can close a school or portion of a school versus the district or the entire school, even though we are in the tipping point 25 or above. Again, with all our efforts and trying to stay in as much as we can, there still may be a time where through contact tracing, we can't run in-person school, but instead of just following you know, the five plus, it may be you know, at, at Maple, we could run the other two schools. So that, we're trying to remain consistent and trying to in, in create an environment that through contact tracing, great communication, we can isolate the closure and still run in-person school with our safety and health and safety requirements as much as we can. So to, as, you, as, you just, as we talk about the secondary level and the elementary, just think about approaching, staying in as much as we can until the numbers and the cases and the nurses and the contact tracing say, Steve, we just can't do it. At the secondary level, and, and, and I've got a lot of emails and, and a, lot of, a lot of just thoughts from staff and we've learned. So there's a tension at the secondary level between efficient delivery of instruction in a model and you know, basically content and how you have people in in a hybrid type fashion. And, um, and that's the tension in the balance that we're trying to figure out. So there's no question that with the consistent remote model that we made some advances in pacing through our content at the secondary level. But there is also, we have an increase in students who are not engaging and not being successful in this model. And that's the tension. What's, you know, what is, is the, the content drive where we've already heard it, right? We have external standards to meet before certain exams. We have certain standards to meet over past. Um, and we have, you know, pathways to make sure that every student become the best version of themselves. So the, and we never, if you remember, we went to a skinny Monday team and two days in for each team. And then we were going two weeks of, um, supported, uh, you know, facilitated remote. And we abridged that due to the cases in December 11th. So we have three weeks coming back from February one to the February break. The first week we would, the, the, we think the balance of content and students in and all students in is a basically a skinny Monday, set the week. The first week it's 50% of the kids in every day. The second week is skinny Monday and then a regular day one, day two schedule, but trying to have a facilitated remote piece so we can continue our content progression and have many kids in who needs, who are targeted for support because we have pretty good data about the kids who are in danger of not being successful. And so we would have a regular schedule for those kids in classrooms. And all of this would be done by synchronous learning to the fullest extent our staffing would allow. So we would like to engage. And remember one of the issues that we've talked about is when we have eight or nine staff with documented medical, uh, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act modifications to their schedule. When they are teaching remote, we need a second, we need an adult in that room. And when you go to the full synchronous model, that adult has student responsibilities as opposed to class responsibilities. And we're not able to run full synchronous um, because we weren't, even though we're trying to hire people, we haven't been able to procure enough staff to run a remote adults for remote teachers and student support for those kids. So that's really the, the question for the board. The balance of, in the secondary level, get all kids in for a week, two kids get, I'd say, about 100 kids in, and those 100 kids are targeted support who really need to be in class with those teachers and following up schedule, which we learned when we cohorted this group earlier in the year and they were in the room for the all day, it wasn't as engaging and we lost kids. So we want 
to change classes, to be in classrooms with teachers, and to do as much synchronous as we can to practice having kids in your class and synchronous as much as we can that our staffing allows and, and be as in as we can at the secondary level, targeting those in need and moving through content at a pace that we think maintains as we get closer to the second semester. I think yeah. that was a lot. Yeah, I don't think I followed fully the secondary. So right. uh, the, first, the first week of February, tell me what you intend to do. So Monday, straight eight, eight 45 minute periods. We see all the kids remote. Tuesday, team, team A, half, first half of team A. Wednesday, second half of team A. Thursday, first half team B. Friday, second half of team B. You have half the kids in on a Tuesday, half the kids in Wednesday, half the kids in Thursday, half the kids in Friday. You, every teacher sees their student twice, once virtually, once in person. And um, we have, uh, and during that, we'll do as much synchronous as we can based on staffing and based on parallel experiences. So that's the first week. What location is this? High school, that's High secondary. And then the, the the following week, skinny yeah. Monday. I yeah. All yeah. At, all eight we get to see the week, and then we have day one on Tuesday with eighty kids, ninety kids, the kids who are struggling, the kids who really need it. They're in class with teachers on Tuesday. On Wednesday, it's day two. Another eighty kids. Yep. Third, it might be the same. Some kids will be in every day. Thursday, yeah. day one. Friday, day two, There's, we have, we have uh, supported learning as targeted, but we have that time the kids then have three classes. Um, of, of they have the teacher three times in the week. So the difference is from what was done before is the 80 or so kids who are coming to school, they weren't traveling their schedule. They were just in school remotely yeah. watching the class. Now you're gonna have them travel through the day and the ones who are not invited in will be remotely doing the same class from home, hopefully. Correct. You got it. And would yeah. that be synchronous, Steve? Like as, we'll much, have... as, 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 as much synchronous as possible um, based on staffing and where we are. We'll go to the fullest extent we can, but those kids um, may, be, you know, may have a, um, a devices in their class with them. And, if you're, our... and so when you can't do synchronous and you're not one of the 80 or 90, in your home, what's happening to you? So, well, you, the teacher will be teaching that period um, remotely and the kids in class will have to have devices so they can, so basically everybody will be remote but some will be in the classroom. But if at some point, if the student has a question and we can do it synchronously, we'll be showing the questions and we'll be teaching it more traditionally. We think that's the balance of content, balance of students, and that gets us three weeks until break. We did talk about doing two of the hybrid weeks, and it's just the, I mean, that's the, always the tension in the secondary level is content, and that's trying to balance that. But it, we under, you know, that's where we're at on trying to balance that tension. Steve, can I ask a, um, I guess I'm, struggling to see the difference between the first week when the kids are hybrid and half the kids are in and half the kids are, you know, they're, they're off day. Doing that and having all the facilitated kids come in at the same time, does that overload the rooms to too much capacity? Is that the problem? Say again for me, Rob. So I guess I'm, I'm confused as to why you couldn't do your, what you're gonna do in the first week, but then have those, uh, those kids who are doing facilitated remote in as well. Does that overload the, the classroom numbers is that the problem with doing that yes yeah, that's, that's the concern i'm going to bump up rebecca because she's done some work about um you know the classes and that piece um so the first model you see the kids twice second model you see the kids three times and that's i'm sorry I mean, steve i think i think you bumped up the wrong person oh look at that sometimes it changes I was hoping Rebecca would raise her hand. I'll find her. She just did. Perfect. Perfect. 
So the the first model gets half the kids in and the teachers with kids two days a week. Second model gets teacher contact three days a week, um, virtually for 75% of the kids, in person for about 25% of the kids. Rebecca, you want to speak to more nuances? It'll take a minute for my, my room to warm up. <laughs> yes. Um, so when we looked at this, um, we the first week of February starts our new semester. So it's really important, we think, to have all the kids come in, meet their new teachers starting off the new semester, turn in any books or materials they had left over from semester one, pick up all their new materials, books, everything that they need for semester two. Um, we want to do that in that hybrid model so that we have the team A days and team B days. They can come in, they get to see all of their teachers, they can see their school counselors, we need to do some schedule changes, they have those opportunities, they get contact with people, which is really important. And then um, we have definitely been keeping really strong data on kids every grade level, seven through 12, who are, are doing all right, and um, some are knocking it out of the park and some are really struggling and need that extra help. Um, what we did just prior to going full remote, um, we had um, some kids coming in and we tried to keep them in pods in certain classrooms with um, certain uh, um, instructional assistants overseeing those pods. Um, the kids that did it were real troopers, but we, we learned some, we, we got some good data, we learned some good lessons. It's really hard to sit still in the same room all day long. That, that was rough. Um, and we were trying to figure out by the end of the day, what can we do to kind of still stay socially distant, but do something, because um, that, was, that was a rough thing. So we know that um, we, need to, we need to keep the pacing that we've started um, because we've, we've made up good ground in each of our um, subject areas. Um, we're not where we usually are by this point in the school years, but, but we're getting there and we've got some good momentum and we have a really nice rhythm right now. Uh, we've got that very familiar day one, day two, even though it's virtual and a little awkward, at least it has that rhythm. So we'd like to keep that rhythm and continuity for our kids as long as we can. Um, we think the way we can do that is to say, come in, get your supplies, see us, reconnect. Um, we'll go the two weeks remote, um, but that will keep the rhythm of the pace of the day one, day two, and allow you to have more contact time in your classes. And then those kiddos that we know are really struggling, they'll come into school. They're still gonna come into school with their laptops or their devices. Um, and rather than have them in a pod, cause it's so hard to sit in one room for that amount of time, they'll follow their schedule. And so they will go to their regular classrooms and they'll do their learning from there. Um, it's a good way for some of our teachers to start to try to, it, it, at first it's probably gonna still look like remote learning, even though they're in the room, but for the teachers that have the equipment or the teachers that are ready to start, we can start playing with that next step of synchronous learning. So we'll have some kiddos in the room that we can start to do that with a little bit, but it'll be really small numbers. So we can really try to figure out what's working, what's not working, where do we need to tweak some technology or tweak some practices. Um, but they're going to have the same experience pretty much whether you're in the room or you're at home. They're still going to have the same pretty much virtual, um, virtual instruction. It's just gonna be the ability to move around a little bit and not sit still all day long. So we'll do that, we'd like to try to do that. Um, so first week hybrid in, see everybody say hi, two weeks, re mostly remote, but some in for support and some extra help and some services that they may need. Um, and then we'll have vacation week. We'll be able to kind of report back before that and figure out how to recalibrate and, and bring you the next rendition of what we do for, for March and moving forward. Thank you, Rebecca. That was really helpful. I'm going to put um, my hand down now. <laughs> so I guess if, if I'm just, if folks don't mind, why don't, if there's more questions on sort of what's been proposed for the middle high school, sort of let, let's talk about that now. And then if there's questions for um, the elementary, we can.
sort of circle back and, and, and have a conversation with that and maybe pull in Amy or Bill if we need to, if they're, if they're on the line. So, you know, any questions or thoughts on sort of this model being put forward? So I, I get the model now and see what you're saying in terms of keeping most of the kids fully remote, you know, allows you to do more content and keep things rolling. Um, and the facilitated kids come in to get, you know, direct. What, what's the thought for after February break? We hope, uh, we hope hybrid, Rob. We'd like to come back in hybrid and check in with everybody and get everybody 50% in and see where we're at. So that's what we'd like to do. And is that hybrid with a, you know, a synchronous approach so that when kids are, I mean, I think, you know, just to, to, to be frank, I, I think there's been so much discussion about, you know, and I understand that teachers, you know, you got a group in front of you and you got a group that's distilled through a screen. Um, and I think if you can do the best you can for the kids that are in front of you and you make it work for the kids that are, that are, are virtual, then, you know, that that's probably better in terms of content um, and maybe a little bit of a struggle, but seems like it's the way we got to go. Yeah, it's the best we can agree and get better at it as we go. See, this is related to all schools, but before I lose it in my notes here, and um, so I understand the idea of the tipping point and the matrix and shifting to soar more of a, a staffing drives the decision. Um, is that in sync with our MOA there, or what's the um, the matrix is not part of the MOA? That was okay. a document for administrative discussion and guidance and, and information. Um, the, as Jim alluded to, and he can talk to it again, but it's the health safety piece of um, washing hands six feet apart, all that fun stuff. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. You know, I apologize for maybe asking again to understand this. I wish it was blown up for us on the screen because it's, I'm trying to map everything together and I apologize. Um, it's basically al almost the same way we had before. One weekend, two weeks out where kids are, are remote and they're learning. You know, if that's what you feel is best, I mean, I just, you know, a lot of these kids want to be back. You know, a lot of these kids want to be in person. A lot of these kids really want to be able to just see their teacher, see their friends, and being one week in and, one, and then two weeks out, I'm, I struggle with that. You get it. No, I get and, it. And that's, that's, I'm just talking to you guys. I'm just like, you know, today I came here really excited, like, yeah, you know, February 1st, and now I'm hearing we're going to try, and then we're going two weeks, and then we're going to reassess. I'm with you. And I'm just being honest with how I feel. I just really 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 want the kids to be able to go back in there uh, if we have the staff we have the capability to keep them safe and, and for them to learn um, we talk about mental health on this board a lot there's kids that don't play sports that really need to be in school absolutely and, and, really, and, it's, and, and, and i and and and, and i got to, i don't have a child that plays sports but i can tell you right now that, that a lot of his friends a lot of people are just like they're tired and they want to be back in person. No, I, I get it. And, and that passion is shared. It's how do you, you know, we, if we go back in, in the hybrid model, the straight eight in two days, um, we can do that. It's just it's the two day week connection right now and the best we can with synchronous. But as, as Rebecca alluded to, there is a flow to this and there is some content. It's the pressure of content, um, but I'm with you. It's, we're trying to balance it. Norm, if you feel we haven't balanced it in the right way, and the board feels I'm not, straight eight and team A, team B, we get it. Yeah, I trust, I trust this board. I'm just giving you a, a perspective of what I see. And I see, the, I see in the community, I see with, with, with interaction with people that, that, that talk to me about them being home. You know, they, they, they want to be able to learn. They want to be able to have that interaction. Um, they don't have the social atmosphere that maybe other students are. And, um, you know, it's just, that's just how I feel. You know, and I, and I, like I said, I do trust this board. I trust you, Steve, Rebecca. I'm just sharing my input for these individuals. Uh, can, I, can I offer, um, Norm, we'd be happy to do more. We truly do not have the staff to go full synchronous hybrid. Um, and what we learned was having kids at home for two days unstructured was not a good call either. So trying to calibrate that component into this 
Um, we agree with you. We, we want to be in probably just as much as the kids. Um, but right now, it, the ability to continue the, the rhythm, like the structure that we've got for kids is, is really important. Um, just having some kind of predictable pattern helps. Um, and, you know, no, I, I mean, hear, I hear what you're saying. I, I hear what I, you're saying. We just don't, we don't have the staff. You know, and, and that's the answer I need. I mean, if you guys say you can't do this based on staff and, you we know, can't I can't. Go full. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to go full, no. No, full so, secret. Because, full, and full. also, Norm, the, with the, some of the doctors, some of the, some of the advice is, if there's community-wide spread, right, if the numbers are different, then they, I'm worried that we're going to get more ADA requests because now we're, we're returning into a condition that is, is, is heightened more than when we left. So, and, 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 I mean, that's just the piece. So, I mean, but so I, I'll dial, I, we agree with you. I'll dial back a little bit because, you know, just me being me, Norm being Norm, but I guess the other question I have is, you know, we agreed as a board, you know, I'm just thinking long scope, you know, risk of our students going back. We talked about that if they, they play sports, they're remote. That's, that's been the agreement. What I have not heard from this board is siblings. You know, there are siblings that are playing. That, how is that formula work into our decision matrix, decision so the, process? The recommendation regarding that is to follow state guidelines and to quarantine if we have a positive case. Because if we are going to quarantine siblings or teachers who have kids who are or teachers who are coaching or teachers doing that, then uh, we will have to, at the high school, we won't be able to go back in the hybrid model. We will be quarantining a number of teachers that, and we won't be able to sub for them and make it work. So uh, the, in discussion with the nurses, that for, for that component, we'll be following state, the recommendation is to follow state guidelines regarding siblings and coaches and other people connected to it, that if there is a positive case or if there is exposure, then it's a contact tracing. Otherwise, we won't be able to run um, our full academic program because we like teachers coaching, but that's the piece. Got it. It was a question mm -hmm. I had asked a while ago, if you remember, you know. The no, it was a great question. It's an appropriate question. And we had deliberate and purposeful discussions with the nurses and the school administration to make sure we had that answer coming to you. And the way to run, come back in school with teachers and that is to follow state guidelines on that uh, case. And it's just, it's just, I'm looking at the risk, you know, I mean, we, we all know and I respect this board for what they decided to move forward. I just, as someone who felt, you know, at, at that time and still now the indoor sports wasn't a good, good opportunity, you know, for us to move forward, but I respect it. I just, I'm looking at, you know, the risk of someone coming into the school district where I just want to know what potentially could happen. So uh, mm -hmm. I respect that. So uh, Rebecca, have you accounted for how you're going to deal with the sports players for that first week of February who are not going to come in, I guess? I, I mean, unfortunately, I, I, they'll be remote. I know we're going to have some students that choose to be full remote regardless anyway, those that probably were remote previous. Um, we'll make sure that we do a, a pick up and a drop off um, so they can pick up the supplies and, and things that they need. But there will be school even remotely yep. every day for every student. Yep. Yep. Uh, team A, team B during that week. Which is for everyone when so you're. They'll, when so, so during that first week, um, they'll have two days of, of time where they log into their class and they're, like, they're actively part of their class. Yep. And then the other two days, they'll be doing asynchronous work. And that's for every, I mean, so the difference is those sports kids on those days that they would be physically in will be remotely in. And then every, the other two days, everybody has two days that week that they're not, that they're asynchronous. Yeah, the caveat we're going to propose, because again, we've, we've learned <laughs> some lessons. Um, even on the asynchronous days, we're going to ask everybody to log into their class long enough to take attendance, have five minutes of the teacher saying, okay, here's what we want you to do during your asynchronous time, and then have them go off and do that work. Um, but we'll have a, a touch point with kiddos four times throughout the day, um, even on their asynchronous day. So they are not two days where they say, oh, I don't have school today. I'll do my work 
whenever. You perhaps show up the last five minutes that they did it because um, <laughs> I, you know, that I found that, I mean, that was the problem with the asynchronous, you know, that really was the problem, I think, was simp was one of the problems at least was accountability and giving them too long of a time horizon to do whatever the thing was. We're perceiving this as happening once that first week. Yep. And then again, we'll be able to kind of ascertain what our next rendition is. So um, hopefully we keep a, a, a good momentum going um, as long as we can. So I, I heard us talking about the 25% in, 75% out. I'm wondering um, how, like how flexible is that number? Can we go higher? Can we start capturing more kids? Maybe they aren't super struggling, but they're not doing great. I, I'm just wondering how wide a net can we cast and can we invite in? And and my encouragement would be, um, you know, to, to pull in as many kids as we have staff and safe available to, to do so. Um, pending your approval tonight of this plan, uh, Mr. Kelly and I have a survey that'll, uh, or letter that um, will kind of explain all of this to parents. In that letter will be a survey that we're going to ask. One of the things we're going to ask again is, you know, do you need, do, do we need to consider your student for remote, uh, facilitated remote? So we will collect all that data. We'll, we'll spend the weekend doing. Um, and you'll have that week to go ahead, invite, figure out our numbers, um, and see what we can balance. So um, we may be looking at a slightly different split for the A and B group. Um, one, to them, Alex, we know it's really hard when one day you had a class of 12, the next day you had Rebecca? No, Rebecca. All males, or oh, there they we were go. all females, and there was a bizarre balance. Um, so we're going to try to, to maybe relook at our splits over the weekend, this weekend, to see if there are some different opportunities to, to do A's and B's differently. Um, and then we will put all that information out really comprehensively to families. But yes, okay. if we, if we, we say, um, the hundred, cause that's about what we had interest in last time, we may have different interests this time and we'll try to kind of accommodate that. Um, any additional questions or thoughts on, on this proposal to, for Rebecca? For having kids in, you both listen to parents, but you reach out to kids too that you think need it, correct? Is that Rebecca? Yes. Is that or Steve, is that right? Yep. They have the SS, they have the student services out. team. A student service team meets and reviews student cases and they actually require some kids to come in. Rebecca, you, are, you must be having problems. Uh, yeah, Rebecca, we could hear you, but I don't know if you could hear us. I don't know if y'all can hear me. My audio cut out, so I'm going to leave for a minute because I don't <laughs> want to interrupt you. We can hear you. We can hear you. So yes, Seth, we have a student services team that meets and um, make sure that we review a list of just our in-house data about making sure people are in. Okay. You know, I, I'll just say one thing. You know, I, I struggle with, with siblings. I know we're following the rules. Uh, I just, you know, sometimes these in students don't have, don't show it, um, and, it, and it can be, it can start something new. I, you know, I really struggle with that. I, I hate denying a student, you know, an opportunity to uh, to learn in person. You know, I think it's very important. But you know, this board decided to move forward with sports, and, and, and that's something that you know we agree, you guys agree upon. But I really do struggle with the potential of um, there being an outbreak in our schools with students maybe not showing symptoms, and that's that's just how how I feel. And you know, I get it. If we want to quarantine kids and coaches and all that, that's fine. That just has an impact on our ability to deliver in-person instruction. It's all balance and tension. And I got I get that. it. Yep. Yeah. Um, I don't want to cut off this conversation short. Um, you know, but it, there's no other, I guess, questions um, now on the sort of secondary model. I wonder if we want to um, just, you know, ask questions or explore the the elementary model um, and anything on our mind as we as we look at that. And so, and we can start with Steve, and then I think if if there's a need to bring anybody else in, it, we sure. can I can bump sort of see who's out like, there. Yeah, why don't we do that now? Yeah. Yeah. I'll bump. No, I, well. I almost sometimes it. I don't know if you had the experience. Sometimes it moves at the last second. Um, 
Sure, and, and Amy and Bill can speak to it. Um, certainly very anxious to get all the littles back, um, teachers back and um, do their model of right 50% every other day, certainly pri prioritizing in what you've heard the necessary to prioritize literacy and numeracy. But Bill and Amy can both speak to what they've learned and what they'd like to, you know, what, what's going to happen February 1. Should I start, Mr. Chamberlain? Sure, Mr. Crowley. Okay. Um, well, certainly we're looking forward to coming back February 1. I think it'll look uh, pretty much the same as uh, when we went uh, full remote, um, where we'll have uh, Team A and Team B. Um, Tuesday and Thursday, Team A, Wednesday, Friday, Friday Team B, uh, Monday, alternating A and B. Uh, we're going to start on February 1 with Team B. Um, one of my goals uh, tomorrow and next week, early next week, is really to come up with a packet of reminders, um, sort of for myself, but also staff and, and community, everything from drop off and pick up, because it's, it's been a while. Uh, and for staff, you know, the duty schedule, get that out again and all those sort of things. Um, we, we do suspect, I was talking to Joe Montana, our uh, behavior specialist today. I, I do suspect that some kids are going to have some troubles, uh, you know, especially coming in um, if they haven't been coming in at all. Um, but we're ready for that and looking forward to, to helping them uh, make the, the transition from, from being home uh, all the time to uh, being uh, at school much of the time. Um, one thing we've decided, by the way, uh, is to keep Chromebooks at home. Uh, we are not going to be asking parents to bring them back, uh, I'm guessing, until the end of the year. Uh, not just because, you know, it's possible we may go remote again, although I hope not, um, but because we can utilize those on the home days. Uh, frankly, we really don't want kids to be in their faces and screens while they're at school in person very much, and maybe occasions where they are but we want to keep that to a minimum. Uh, home days, uh, for I think more for grades two and three might utilize some of the Chromebooks and digital technology. Uh, we're still going to rely a lot on paper for the home days, which uh, for the primary uh, kids, especially K-1, but really K-3 um, is really PK-3, is really a big part of their job um, is to prepare uh, families for those packets and to make them high quality and make the paper valuable. Uh, those of you who aren't Harold Martin people um, might not know, but every teacher has a big bucket, um, as do the special ed teachers and the interventionists, you know, the reading people and math people. And we fill those buckets regularly uh, for pickup often on the weekends. So that'll be an important part of what we do too. And I think um, especially K-1 digital is just not enough. And so that's why. So uh, in summary, I, I think it'll look a lot like it, it did before. Um, I, I'm just slightly worried, not really worried, but I just want to make sure we're prepared uh, for the transition um, for all of us, I think. I'm Speaking personally, I've, I've been going in every day um, because there's a few kids in from time to time. And uh, it's just, it's good for me uh, to be in the building anyway. And um, I'm just so looking forward to the the hallways being uh, busy once again. Well, I just want to say as a parent of Harold Martin, you know, the way things are organized over there has been great, being able to pick, it, pick everything up. So thank, thank you very much. Um, the questions that's been asked over and over again of this board is how are we going to adapt to the students from K1, K, you know, one through two that are, we are seeing behind remotely. How are we going to get them up to speed in order to um, meet those needs? Maybe they have not been getting since we've gone remote or even, you know, during this whole pandemic. It's been a question I can't answer, um, but, you know, a lot of parents out there feel that, you know, that their kids are maybe haven't gotten um, everything that they, they, they should be getting. I think they're, they're hopefully getting what we can give them for uh, instruction. Um, but I do agree with a lot of the sentiments I've heard from the public tonight and, and Norm, from what you're saying right now. Um, I've already started the conversation, literally started a couple Google Docs um, with um, uh, a couple staff members, and we're going to move on from that too. Uh, it's some sort of catch-up program. And I, I don't know exactly how it's going to look. I would love, and I've talked to Steve about this too, I'd love to utilize some uh, well, probably ESSER money may be coming in. Uh, don't know how much it's going to be to um, 
utilize uh, some of that to, to hire people to come in a little bit this summer. Uh, this is just, you know, please don't hold me to this, but I think, you know, even um, helping parents a little bit this summer, you know, teaching them a little bit about, you know, probably could have done this a year ago, right? Uh, literacy and numeracy and, and some things they could do to help their children. But really it, it's going to take some strong, uh, maybe small group, uh, instruction for kids and, and not just special ed kids, not just kids that, that are identified in some capacity, but, you know, a lot of kids, if not most kids need something. So uh, it's on our minds. Um, and I think it'll change even if we're back 100% next year. I think it's going to change some of our instruction and priorities uh, going into next year. So uh, uh, Andrea earlier tonight talked about how you know, there are a lot of things that are going on that, that the public doesn't know. We don't talk about the scoop and skim and so on. Uh, we probably wouldn't have enough time. Um, but this is one of those things that there's a lot of discussion. You know, I, I talked about this topic with uh, this week, my Harold Martin Assessment Committee, with my Remote Learning Committee, uh, with my uh, PLC leaders. So it really is a lot of discussion, a lot of seriousness around this. You have to understand a lot of teachers at the primary level, especially since we have been for the last 10, 15 years, really looking at, at numerical data, numerical data, uh, there's actually a little competition in a, in a positive way. Teachers want to see those numbers go up. They want to see the data uh, do well. So I, the other thing I think we need to do is, is figure out where kids are at right now. Um, probably by the end of the year, we'll have a pretty good sense uh, of what our, our challenge is. So um, I, I don't have any great, perfect answers right now, but I can tell you we're, we're working on it. No, just to sum it up, I mean, Steve has made the case that, you know, through data, we've needed to hire a new numerous assistant. And this is all part of our budget and yeah. budget in process where to all 76 attendees, I mean, this is this is stuff that we are seeing from our, our leadership saying that we need another numerous assistant in this district in order to meet the needs of students who are lagging behind um, from being remote. Agreed. Bill, I'm just... Um just thinking about what you just said um, last and laid out. So I'm just curious, like, how do you, like, how do you intend, at, you know, as you sort of figure out, you know, what, what sort of the future looks like, how do you intend to communicate that with parents? Because I think part of, you know, um, part of, um, I think the communication that we've been receiving is, you know, parents hungry um, to understand, you know, what, what those steps are. And so I'm, I'm just, um, I understand you've been working with your leadership team trying to figure that out, but I'm just, and I guess it's unfair to ask you that, that for an answer right now. So maybe it's more like, I, I think, you know, parents are hungry for that communication. And so as you're developing it, I guess my encouragement is to, you know, to share that because I do think um, rightly so parents are concerned um, or anxious. And, and I think the more that, you know, um, you and your team can help them understand, you know, what steps you're taking, I, I think would help a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think transparency is the most important thing. Um, you know, uh, we may have to, there's some news that may not be great for all kids, but we have to be honest with, with parents and, and say, you know, this is where your child is at and this is where we hope they're going to be. I mean, the one, it's not really a saving grace, but I think all children are, are probably <laughs> a little behind. So um, I, I think we have a, uh, a challenge that is, is for all of us as opposed to, you know, a, you know, a small group. But I, I think transparency is the most important thing. And so as I'm thinking about this almost on the spot, I'm thinking, you know, by the end of the year, we certainly would want to um, communicate to parents um, pretty bluntly where we think uh, their children are at. And, and you know, but at that point, we got to have a plan for how we're going to, um, you know, catch them up to some extent. Um, I, I think it's not going to be probably quite as serious as, as parents think. Kids are pretty resilient. And they do catch up quickly. I, I reminded of a student who years ago, this is just one example, but he was, he was homeschooled. And, and this is not a slam on homeschoolers. Most parents do an incredible job, but this particular parent knew it wasn't working and they, they didn't know how to teach literacy. They were great in other content areas. Uh, and he started out extremely low. And he gained uh, like two grade levels in a matter of months because he had the capacity to do it and he had good teaching. Uh, and that was the ability to do it. And, and, and now he's, he's just perfectly grade level and doing fine. So I, I think, I feel very positive that we have the staff, we have the resources to make it happen. Um, but it, it'll take a little bit of time though. It'll probably take a full year for us to, to come close to catching up, I would think. So I'm gonna jump in on the same so, you know, I'm listening to you and thinking about 
the, the difficulties of making this all happen, but I'm also thinking about the, uh, the timetables and that it would be probably a really good thing to, to at least lay out a, a rubric and a timetable of, you know, these are the possible options. These are the potential obstacles, whether that's financing, testing, but it would seem to me that it might put parents at ease that if they saw some kind of a timetable as to this is what our potential possibilities are by April break, perhaps, then you know the end of the year just seems really far away to wait to see what that is. Um, but if in April we said, okay, this is these are the plans, and then you know in May there's going to be some testing, and these are the possible ways, then I think uh, you know maybe that would help everybody see what the future might look like a little bit better. But I mean, I for one would love to see some kind of a timetable that lays out what the plan is. Um, and, and not holding you to what that is, because I know there's a lot of moving parts there, but at least to put the options on the table um, would be probably very much appreciated. Yeah, I, I think we could have a, a plan in place uh, by, say, April vacation. Um, what I don't know is if we can have, I, I kind of want to have a solid sense of, of the challenge per student that might take into May or so. I'm just thinking in terms of the actual assessments. I want to get, I want to get some good in-person instruction going here real soon and, and a little bit of time to do that. But in terms of a plan, um, and some of it's going to depend on what we can get for money from, from uh, you know, grants and so on too, but. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I just had a question. What, so what sort of assessments do you use? Like, you know, I know at, um, you know, actually a couple of years ago, you you and Amy did a whole presentation on assessments to the PTA, um, but I, I don't remember everything. Um, so for the younger kids, what what kind of assessments do we do? And I, I also want to acknowledge the challenge of doing assessments during a pandemic and during a time when kids have been out will give you data, but it may not give you um, the most accurate data. Um, sure. The other circumstances. Um, Little, little guys, say kindergarten kids, um, th we do a lot of checklisty things, uh, you know, sounds, you know, obviously uppercase, lowercase letters, you know, things like that. Uh, they do take the star, uh, not for math, but for literacy, they take the star test even in K. Uh, one to three, uh, they, uh, all kids take the star for math and reading. Um, we, uh, we also do probably one of the best things we do is what we call our benchmarks, which come from a a duo called Fontas and Pinnell in the old, old days, it was called the DRA, but very similar. And that's where we, we get a really good sense of what reading level they're, they're reading on. And one of the best advantages of F&P, Fontas and Pinnell, is that, that teachers do it one-on-one. -on -one. And, you know, special ed teachers will tell you this too, the teacher who does the, the actual assessment also learns so much about the child and it helps them with their instruction. So and don't get me started. You know, Amy and I could talk all night about these sort of topics. We have to do a podcast again soon, Amy. That way we can talk about it more. But um, you know, those are the assessments that really work. So it, we, it, what's difficult right now is we don't have as many Chromebooks as we'd like to have because they're home. So we have some logistical issues. But I think we can get a really good sense of of where a, a child is at um, through our other assessments as well. So some are you know computerized. A star, you sit down and you on an iPad or a Chromebook or a computer and, and you take it. Um, and it, it's, I think, fairly accurate. And then the, the Fontas and Pinnell is much more uh, teacher to student. And then you get, a, you get a reading level as a result from that. And that drives your instruction, basically. Amy, do you want to add to that? Oh, yeah. I am, um, you know, at, at Maple Street. And can, I, can should I start from the beginning like Bill did and let you know my our plan? Or do you have other questions for Bill before I jump in? We might, but I think you, you have the floor, so you should jump in. Okay. Um, so at, at, at Maple Street, we will run a similar um, program that Bill talked about, um, our Team A, Team B back in the building, starting with Team A, I'm sorry, starting with Team B on Monday, February 1st. Um, you know, as Bill mentioned, we're putting together uh, the, the skim to push out to parents to let them know of things like to fill out the COVID screener before you come into the building, um, the kinds of things that your student will need if they're in the hybrid model, masks, water bottle, uh, personal hand sanitizer. You know, we've been out of those routines. Um, so we'll be sending out some information to families um, tomorrow and then over the course of next week. 
Um, we too will be looking at um, keeping Chromebooks at home. Um, there, there are some students that I think may prefer to bring their device back and forth. Um, and certainly, you know, I think because they're a little older, um, you know, that they, they can take those responsibility. We have deployed um, Chromebooks in, you know, great cases. So especially our sixth graders, if they're more comfortable using the device that they will then use at home, um, I think we would support that effort. Um, for those home days, I think that Maple Street will be a little different than Harold in that I, I do think that the a lot of the instruction will be pushed out digitally through Google Classroom. Um, we have found during this period of remote learning that um, fourth graders, fifth graders, sixth graders, they are readily able to access their the content, their assignments, the additional support materials um, through that the, through that platform. Um, but we certainly will be sending home, um, you know, we call it DLI which is grammar and spelling um, practice through um, our, a paper means, um, sending home math workbooks, um, sending home books to read for their book groups. Um, so certainly there will be a, a, a paper component, but I do think that kids will still be using their devices on their home days. We are though looking, uh, like Bill, I have a PLC uh, set of PLC leaders and steering committee that meets and, and we happen to meet today and really talking about how can we keep purposeful connection with kids when they are at on their home days. Uh, I think it'll be too much for kids to bear to be so connected to their, to their teachers and their classmates as they have been uh, for us to just you know, for that to drop off. So we are looking at how can we continue to do things like morning meeting, um, snack and, and lunch during the day, um, and, and then some kind of closing or culminating activity at the end of the day. Um, at Maple Street, you know, we have really tried um, to keep kids connected during the day. I happened to, to, to pop in to a student, to a, a teacher's classroom today when they were doing snack and, and kids were just really enjoying each other's time. I mean, the fact that, you know, they were all little, you know, screen uh, pictures on the screen, but they're, you know, playing, playing a game together, talking about what they're going to do after. It, it was very similar. The conversations are very similar that, to what you would um, overhear it, when things are in person. So um, I think it's important to continue to offer for those, uh, you know, social, emotional, and and personal connections to students. Um, to answer your question about how will we, you know, how will we bridge those curriculum gaps? I mean, that is a really um, interesting question and one that there's just so, you know, so many professionals and educators are writing about it right now because. Um, the reality is, is that our, our kids during this time have developed skills that we, we've never assessed for, right? They're, they're doing things and they have skill sets that aren't being assessed on the star or aren't being assessed in other ways because we weren't providing instruction in that way. But, you know, their um, ability to, you know, you know, get into a Google Classroom, navigate that, look at, you know, multiple assignments at once, um, submit an assignment, videotape themselves doing something. I mean, those are, are things that aren't in the common core standards, <laughs> but wow, I mean, they have gained a lot of skills. So I think when we look at where are, what are the specific skills that kids are missing, you are going to see it in math, no, no doubt, right? Because if they're not receiving the instruction and, and you know, Steve and I were both math teachers, you know, teaching fractions, you know, today I, I saw, you know, a, a teacher getting ready to teach a lesson on um, subtracting mixed numbers with renaming. That is a really hard skill to teach even in person. Um, but, you know, they were able to use um, online manipulatives and videos and, you know, having the teacher there is, is, is helpful. I do think we're going to have to use our assessments. So at Maple Street, we use STAR. Um, we also use AmesWeb, which is a, um, an, another tool that we have. Uh, we also have thought about using the state testing. They have interim assessments. Um, and we're lucky enough to have like Rebecca Gagnon is an assessment guru. You know, she knows about that kind of stuff and um, figuring out how to um, really hone in on the skills that kids need. And then, you know, just being honest with um, either the, the sending teacher that you're sending your students to or the your receiving teacher really looking at you know these kids did a lot of you know the, the types of skills that are are you know more conducive to teaching in a remote environment um, 
but saying just honestly, we did not, you know, this, these kids are going to need a refresher on fractions and the next teacher is going to have to accommodate for that. And you saw teachers do this um, during the years that we were transitioning to the Common Core. We did a lot of crosswalk work um, where you're looking at, you know, what are the standards? What were they? How do we get from here to there? Um, you know, in my previous position as a, as a math teacher, we looked at a three-year plan. So we were very purposeful about identifying the skills that needed to be retaught and practiced and who was going to do it, who was going to own it. We developed a crosswalk document. You know, the difference here is we don't have a curriculum person, you know, in, in where I came from in Bo, we had a curriculum director that that was their job um, to develop those documents. So that's, you know, I'm just being honest, that's problematic because you don't have someone spearheading that work. Um, but it was really helpful. And, um, but there were a lot of conversations in the summer. You know, you, you really have to provide teachers the time because they can't do the in-person instruction right now and you know develop at least it's my opinion you know that they would need opportunities to really come together and collaborate in the summer and that's above and beyond you know what they're doing we just couldn't manage that i do think we can do the assessments as bill's talked about um, between now and you know our our spring benchmarks you know, we'll be able to identify the kids that need that above and beyond. Um, extended school year, I think, will look really different across the district. Um, Mandy's got some really great ideas about how that's going to look. Um, it's a really capable team of people. It's just, you know, I, I think we're still in that phase where we need to get people vaccinated back in in uh, in person, you know, so that we can really dig into to what is happening. So. Um, I'm not sure I answered all of the questions that I was trying to take notes as, as I went um, to try to give as comprehensive an answer as Bill has given, but if you have other questions for me, I'm, I'm happy to take them. Amy, you did great. <laughs> yeah, you always answer the question before I ask it, but um, will you be able to provide something similar to what Rob's asked for Bill, to kind of for us to be able to look at both schools? Um, that way in April, this board can look at the data and say, okay, this is where we need to look at in order to, um, to determine our next move. Is that possible? I think so. We have really capable um, a, a lit literacy team um, at both buildings that are, you know, very invested in that type of curriculum work. Um, Jess Pickering, our new nu numeracy um, specialist, she, you know, really can dig right into lots of different types of data. Um, it'll just be, I think, revealing and figuring out what we're going to prioritize, because I, I do think that a lot of things are going to, you know, that there will be different areas that that hit. Um, and so when you first look Look at a set of data it almost looks like a you know a, set, a christmas tree right we're lighting up for fractions we're going to be lighting up for um you know uh non-fiction text or you know you just so but you only have a finite amount of time um so it'll be you know how do we want to prioritize that but i think we could get some kind of document out and um you know you know that bill and i work very well together and i'm sure we'll collaborate on this and put out something to the elementary um, families that is cohesive and also is more K to six than it is like this is what kindergarten will look like this is what second grade because that's that's not good for for parents they just you know they want something that's comprehensive so I think you know I'm looking at Bill we can work on that together um, and put something out yeah, but you. also also knowing just one more it, it, it'll have to be you know flexible or organic, right? Because we would put something out, but we have to be responsive to the data that we collect. Yeah, and as, as Bill alluded to, and, and Michelle's doing research, the next stage of the grant funds, our uh, catch-up learning is an appropriate use of those funds, as well as, of course, PPE and others. But um, there will be some funds that can be allocated for this catch-up notion. Any other? Concerns, thoughts, questions um, while we have Bill and Amy? I have, a, I have another kind of like random disparate questions. And Amy, you, you sort of touched on one. Um, I guess for, for both schools, when we return to hybrid, kind of the opportunities for any, and I'm gonna call it <clears throat> synchronous at home days. Um, I know it's very, very different from middle high school and I'm not asking for that, um, but as far as the, the check-ins, the morning meetings, um, or I know sometimes one of my children will check in with NIA and just loves that. Um, so I didn't know if there are any other um, ideas on that. Just I'm just trying to think of 
more ways for kids to continue having a touch point with the with the schools. Um, we, we do do some of that. I can't say it's everybody. Um, some of our kids who struggle the most, uh, we actually do have an IA or, or two that works in that grade level that does touch in with kids and provide sort of office hours. Um, ironically, most of our, not most, not ironically, but a lot of our intervention from reading and even special ed actually happens uh, online on the home days, which has worked out really well. It's one of those, the few things that at times has actually been better or certainly better than being in person with masks and behind a shield. Um, that one-to-one -one intervention uh, has worked out fairly well for a lot of kids, more than we expected actually. Not that I wanna replace anything in person uh, with that. Um, but yeah, I think I'm constantly thinking, Andrew, about how we can improve those those days. Of course, part of the problem is teachers are still teaching on those days, so they they can't you know leave their classroom to to touch base. And it's not like we have a lot of IAs you know just hanging around. But but I yeah, we'll think more about that and, and try to maximize that as much as we can. But but Andrea, it's not lost on you know the staff um, and that really have, you know, it, they've really enjoyed having the consistent connection with their students, right? You know, we went from, you know, you, you might have a team B on a Thursday, you don't see them again until the, the Tuesday, because it's not their Monday day. And, you know, to be able to see kids every day, I mean, that is what, or, or to at least be connected to someone at their school, because, you know, even though it's remote, and even though we're, not together physically, it's really important that kids know that they belong at their school. You know, that is, you know, of utmost importance, I think, to teachers, to administrators. Um, I know that, you know, the, the idea of, you know, caring for kids, whether they're on the screen or in person, um, there's just no replacement for that. And connection, it has to, it has to continue to happen. Um, but having the staffing to do it is, is going to be the challenge, right? Because the majority of the instructional assistants in, in my building are assigned to a student um, for one-to-one -one support. And so they just don't have the time in their schedule. Um, but we, you know, we are creative people. We're flexible. We're nimble. We're going to do our best. Great. Um, and so my other question, like I said, they're they're kind of disparate questions. So um, I know we've been talking about assessments, and um, I know that we're we've generally been, and I appreciate this about our school. We're not like we're not numbers chasers. We don't we don't go chasing numbers. Um, but I I do wonder if there would be a way um, if you were able to to help show us. Um, a general understanding of where our kids were and where they are now. Um, I think that could also help inform this discussion because, you know, when we're having these discussions, I don't know if we're talking about kids being a couple weeks behind or if they are, you know, a grade level behind. And I, I feel like that nuance, even if it's a, a real generalization, just helps inform um, the conversation. Um, so that's kind of a, a general ask, I guess. Yeah, the tricky thing about that is going to be that um, the tests that we use, uh, you know, however they're referenced, the sample, all of those kids have been impacted by the pandemic as well. So your, your data is going to be skewed. We certainly, you know, we don't tend to look at... Um, you know, fourth grade to fourth grade, we tend to look, we tend to follow that grade and their, um, you know, their, their progress over time. Um, but, you know, the star test, it bases, it, the results are based on the sample that's taking the test. So, you know, all the kids are impacted. So, and the New Hampshire SAS as well, we did the interim test and you can get interesting data from that. Um, it's, it is much more, um, you know, more global about kids functioning because it is, there's a lot of open-ended responses. Um, our STAR is more standards-based and then our AIMSWeb is more skill-based. So I do think we can get um, good results from there, but I don't know, Andrea, I think what I'm imagining as a math teacher is that you're almost looking for like a spreadsheet or a line graph that shows in the fall of this, this is where you were and this is where you are now. Um, I would just worry about 
you know, that comparison not having the same standard deviations, you know, in terms of groups of, of, of students. But I think what we could do is, you know, look at all of the information that we have um, and try to put something together that makes sense to parents. Um, the, the state data also was developed, you know, that the, what they're going to put out is, is based on, we didn't have a spring test. Um, and so it's interim data. So that's a little tricky as well, but I think we can put together something. Um, I just worry about, um, you know, you can, I always, you know, I always talk to kids about, um, you know, you can use data to say anything you want it to say. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be misleading. I want to be very transparent about, you know, what the numbers are telling us, but keeping in mind that the data, the, the, the tools that we use inform instruction. We don't use them, you know, to, to um, identify, you know, weaknesses in students. We use it to inform our instruction. Yeah, I think even qualitatively instead of quantitatively, um, you know, I would be very much open to that as well. Just qualitatively, um, the story, the narrative, where, where are we? Um, I, I just think that it's really easy for us to, um, you know, let, let our, our imagination run wild uh, and assume the worst and assume mm -hmm. that our kids are doing the worst. And so I, I think just helping to um, kind of craft where exactly we are. I don't need, I don't need a, a graph. <laughs> um, you don't have to bring me actual numbers, um, but I think just, I would love a, just a better understanding of where we are. Um, and, it, and, it, and it can be in story form. It doesn't have to be in, in a bar graph. Yeah, I think, uh, and Amy would agree with me, our teachers are, are pretty experienced. They have a really good sense and intuition on where kids are at. And I, again, I don't want to say it tonight because I, I think they just need to get the kids back in the classroom. That's why I mentioned before, uh, we'll have a really good idea after a few months. It might even be till May um, in terms of, of how much we need to worry. But um, I do trust, and we often say good assessment just informs intuition. Um, so teacher intuition is pretty powerful and that's a qualitative factor really. Other other thoughts or questions? Um, anything else, Bill and Amy, for us that you that you haven't shared that um, is on your mind that that you would like to? Want me to bump them? <laughs> <laughs> Steve's very excited was... about about bumping. Um, I, I, I think they want to go back to their. Uh, but no, thank you so much, Bill and yeah. Amy. They did a great job. Yeah, we'll be listening. Definitely. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, you know, this is maybe just a question that, uh, just for the board. Um, you know, we've heard from all the, uh, you know, the building leadership um, on sort of their plans for coming back. I guess just doing a, um, I don't know what the right term is, but how, how are we all feeling about this um, as we sort of head into, you know, um, February? Um, and then, you know, what things should we be thinking about um, or, or asking Steve to think about um, as we sort of get beyond, you know, the first couple of weeks there in February that we might be looking for in terms of, you know, Andrea's brought out some ideas. Um, Rob, you have as well as around, you know, what happens, um, uh, you know, when can we get a report by April? Just wondering if there's other things on our minds that we want to sort of put out as markers or things to continue sort of discuss and think about as we head, you know, through February into March in the spring. I guess the big one for me, uh, Jim and, and Steve, is you know what what role vaccines will play in changing our our playbook. You know, if if all teachers can get vaccinated, uh, you know, by April vacation, does that completely change what May and June can look like? I mean, I know that students, you know, there aren't vaccines for kids under sixteen, and you know, I, I just I don't know what the the guidance is out there. Uh, well, I know what some of the guidance is, but um, you know, we, how, how does that change the game? That's and I'm talking with the nurses. The the protocol is ten days after the second uh, um, vaccination is the all clear. You know, when you're considered vaccinated. Um, yeah. So you know, so that's where we work back. You know, from that notion. So. Um, you know, we hope, um, that, you know, March, we've heard for that, right, for that phase and how long March is, but I agree with you, the, the, the bet, it would be great if we could get that 10 days, you know, post a second vaccination component 
um, you know, April vacation ish. And yeah, I do think it would it, it leaves open for us to to sub, you know substantially look at our model. That's the hope. Plus, you know, all the stuff we liked about the fall, Rob. Right, windows were open all the time. We're outside as much right. as possible. I mean, in the fall, our teachers were out all the time. All those really good wonderful health practices anyway combined with you know in, in that environment um we hope that that does give us a chance to change our our model in a good way i'm with you would we have to negotiate a new moa with them based on them getting a vaccine um all that stuff you know maybe requiring all that stuff i mean is that something that goes into in order for us to maybe have to look at that jim i'm, I'm not sure i don't know if i'm talking out of line here i'm just trying to, to get oh, a feel no. for what is the I know that underlying health conditions have been bumped up and we have a significant amount of um, teachers that have qualified for that. Um, if they're bumped up to that um, tier, doesn't that change a little bit of the staffing issue that we have here in the district? No, I'm with you, right. If, if, if those staff members through other categories are eligible for the vaccine, how does that impact their uh, eligibility under ADA? That's a great question. Norman, that's something we're starting to have discussions with as a leadership team as a vaccine has more, but I think you're right on. Uh, that certainly would would uh, um, be a you know, factor as we head back into you know, more, more staff in school. Yeah, and I think Norm, to the other, just I think as circumstances change on the ground, um, you know, if, if teachers are vaccinated and getting vaccinated, then, you know, that, that in my view, that's, um, that's grounds for us to go back to the to the MOA and have a discussion about you know what do those changes mean to our to our model and, and to the you know, amount of students we can bring at, back into the building um, and so that would be in my view one of those major factors that would help help the change sort of how we're thinking about this but it's hard to do that now because you know we we don't know what the vaccination model is we don't know when teachers are going to be eligible we don't really eligible we don't really have a time frame um, we have some general parameters but um, but until we get some more of those I guess a, a fundamental reality of, of when those things might might change. Um, it, it's hard to go and renegotiate an MOA or open it back up if if it's unclear if and when you know the circumstances would allow. So, and that was part of the discussion that we had um, with the associations is that you know as as things change, um, we'd come Absolutely. back to the table and and have those discussions. And so my expectation and hope is. Um, that those fundamentals do change and do change quickly so that we can go back to the table and and, and, um, and revisit it all. Because then that would eliminate staffing, you know, as as, as some of the issues. And that's what we want. We want to be able to secure. Right. Okay. Yeah. I agree. Thank Mr. You. So there's two other things that I think would be helpful. Um, and it's, it's, it's hard to say what the timing is on it, but you know, um, at least what we're hearing out of out of the new administration in, in Washington is that there's going to be a lot more guidance. You know, one of the things personally that I felt um, was completely missing over the past um, year was any sort of guidance coming out of um, you know coming out of Washington, but even guidance coming out of the state of New Hampshire for how how districts should be planning and thinking. And um, but it, it, that it feels like anyway, at least the rhetoric is that's going to change and that there's going to be a lot more um, you know trying coordination and planning. Um, I wouldn't say instruction, but at least um, guidance um, for how how districts should be thinking about, you know, incorporating um, some of the best practices and in, in returning to school. And so I would just, I, I would appreciate, because I can't, it's hard to keep up with all the news all the time. Um, but as, as Steve, you and your team are, are getting some of that information, both from, you know, both from Washington and, and also from here in New Hampshire, if somehow that could be shared, I think with the board and the community, because um, I do, at least maybe it's my optimistic side. My optimistic side tells me that that there's going to be a lot more and it's 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 going to be actionable stuff that that we can start to incorporate into our planning and thinking. And so um, if you do receive that, if, if maybe it's just putting it into the, the shared folder, um, I think would just be really helpful in, in between meetings as we're as we're all contemplating what happens next. You got it. Happy to. Anything else? For, Go ahead, Andrea. Yeah, sorry. I was going to pop in. Um, I guess I'd like to um, learn a little bit more about what our summer programming needs are and what that's going to look like. And if we do need to start thinking now about extending the extended program um, and how we can do that, um, 
you know, that's that's something that I'm thinking about. I I like um, and encourage you know the um, middle high school to pull in as many a high as percent as of children as possible into in school during these um, kind of our new hybrid that we're going into. Um, yeah, those are my my two main ones. I know, you know, I know we've I've also thought and talked about and we've gone back and forth and I understand that a, a lot of it is really a um a child care issue. Um, you know, I, I know that I've asked again um about the possibility of going to half days, um, but that was not for for our our um, Harold Martin School, and it was not well received. I remember those hours and hours of, <laughs> yep. and hours of public comment of folks not supporting the, the half days. Um, but I do, I, I would ask that we just remain at least open to some other possibilities as we move forward, whether it's getting our kids outdoors in classrooms as much as possible. Um, you know, just really trying to to capture these kids as best as we can. It took us a long time to get to this point with 400,000 people um, who have died from COVID. You know, it took 10 months. Uh, so I think, you know, I'm reminded of when I had kids and I was told, look, it took nine months for my body to get all crazy stretched out from being pregnant. You can't expect everything to snap back right away. Um, and that that might be an metaphor that or analogy that only resonates with women who have had children. But, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just thinking ahead of a, a longer runway, not just the summer, it's going to be next year. Um, you know, really, we're looking at like a two year kind of catch up phase. Um, I guess my, my optimism comes from the fact that when we moved here, my kindergartner was not reading and hated school, we moved in the middle of January. Um, and now, several years later is is caught up and is loving school again. So I guess I take that personal anecdote to heart. Um, but at the same time, when we're talking about a majority of our school, it's really hard to to have that same optimism um, and hope. But I will carry it. So those are just a couple of other things I was thinking about. And we can, because there are, once we get the funding, there are some decisions that are, there are time-based regarding our collective bargaining agreement and how we uh, engage or actually can, you know, compel or require or just encourage a staffing over the summer. Um, and, and so I, I think this discussion, uh, and I, Amy and Bill and, and Rebecca and Chris, you know, I think they have started thinking about this catch-up model, and I think this helps us continue to plan, and you're right. The more information the community, the better as they are dealing with, with the trauma and concern about, uh, worried about the most precious cargo in the world and their academic performance. I, I'm with you. I think this conversation has been really good. So thank you. You know, and I, and I, you know, I agree a little bit with what you say, Andrew. I just, I just hope it's not two years. I hope that we can try and do it um, appropriately and at a good pace where these students are able to. It's a lot of students. Uh, we don't know. We don't have the report, but I'm, I'm, it's a concern for me, too. I agree. I just want us to also have reasonable expectations and it's and uh, hoping for a catch up over uh, 12 weeks in the summer may not be reasonable. I doubt it is reasonable. It took us 10 months to get here. It's going to take agree. us some time to get back out of it. Yeah, I agree with you. I just don't know what the window is. I just want to be optimistic about it. Um, and the last question I have uh, for everybody, because we, we talked about it, but uh, I'm not sure we, we came to a consensus. Um, and so Steve talked about the matrix um, and, and maybe thinking about the decision matrix um, uh, a little bit differently. And so Steve, he laid out, you know, how he would be approaching it. And I just, I, I just wanted to see how, how folks felt about that. And if there's any, you know, strong feelings and objection or, or um, anything we want to revisit and talk about. I thought we had agreed previously that the matrix was a guide, not a rigid model, and that administration should use it as a way to, to focus their thinking, but not dictating decisions. The, 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 the Seth, yes, but there was a limit uh, based. I think the direction was with very few cases, um, it could be managed on a case by case. But once we got up to you know where we were, then it was to follow the matrix, and um, you know right. five or more we had talked about. So. I mean, for example, I just want, if we had, you know, three at Maple and two at Harold Martin, that right now would be closing the district until further notice. 
And based on this discussion, the high school would still run. If assuming contact tracing and the connections of siblings and all that, um, I just want to make sure I appreciate Jim, you know, clarifying this because it, you know, um, we're going to, the, the philosophy would be to stay in as long as we can, extend staffing and safety. And if, we, and if we can't determine our contact tracing, we're going to close for a day until we're sure, right? But we're going to come back and not sweep the entire district into a remote piece because of something going on in second and third grade. I just want uh, to. Yeah, so you, in my opinion, you, sh you should use the matrix as a guide, but you should be using the collective wisdom of your leadership and health team to make these okay. decisions. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to just say to you, I'm um, Steve, thank you. I know that this is not easy, and I know it's hard to come up with the right path. Um, and the questions we've asked you tonight have been difficult and you may not have the answer, but I just want to say thank you to your team for. Um, Appreciate it presenting what you can. It's a unique time for us. So thank you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate the acknowledgement. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going back to the matrix, but I appreciate you as well. Um, I, I, I think that honestly, uh, if you can use it as on a micro level as possible, that would be great. So if you have two cases and they are in one class, only that class closes down and the rest of the grade stays open and the rest of the kids stay in. If contact tracing does not say that it has gone outside of that classroom, I feel that we know more about COVID now than we did when we were starting to adopt um, the matrix. I also think that it is perhaps spread differently than we anticipated that it would. It, it hasn't looked like it would, at least I can speak for myself. Um, I kind of assumed much more of a very quick um, viral spread throughout schools, and we've happily not seen that. Um, I think it, a, a good part due to our distancing and masking and, and whatnot. Um, but I would really love to see it sort of used even more. I think Jim says this as a scalpel um, than as a broadsword. And that's the discussion with the nurses, especially at the elementary school where there's a different level of cohort. The high school we've talked about, they change classes. So the elementary, I think we have a, a, bill, a, a stronger ability to, I guess, the scalpel, as you just said. Um, at high school, though, uh, when we do get, you know, 250 people in, there's a lot of cross work. Just that was a discussion with Amy, Jean, and Nicole. And, you know, I'm, I'm just, um, I'm, I'm happy, um, you know, that you and your leadership team and nurses are having these discussions. And, you know, I, I just go back to, you know, risk management and risk assessment and, uh, and balancing that and, like, what I, what I, think and, uh, is the need to keep as many students in the classroom as we can. And so, um, so doing that safely is important, but in, you know, the matrix is a risk management assessment tool. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to weigh more heavily on the in-student learning. And so I, I think Andrea's scalpel analogy is really good. So um, with a focus on in-person, you know, um, use the, the matrix to help us, help us keep people safe through a scalpel approach rather than um, I like the broadsword. I usually use sledgehammer, but um, to that approach, which I think now, given where we are and given where the community is with spread, I, I think that's probably the right approach. Because if we use a sledgehammer, it's unlikely we'll see kids in the classroom. Um, so, and and just to reiterate, these, these this is not a decision I make by myself. Hang it out, uh, you know. And Rob's talked about this. We've all talked about this. Is with nurses, with administration, with Michelle. If we're talking about cleaning and where we are, it really is a team decision about our judgment, can we be safe? As Andrea just said, with our masking, with our distancing, with the, the try to get as much in as we can for as long as we can until we can't. All right, um, well, thanks everyone. Um, so we're gonna move on unless there's any objection to um, an update from Norm on uh, the budget committee. Um, meetings that he's had, he's at two, uh, the 13th and the 20th. And so uh, now we're gonna hand it over to you to tell us the magic you've been working. Yeah, deep breath, here we go. No, um, first off, I wanna say thank you to the board for helping, you know, during the process of going to the budget committee, you know, from Rob, Andrea, Jim, and staff, all of you guys have had a huge impact and presented our budget to the budget committee. Um, it's been an interesting couple of weeks. I think great discussions, great talks. Um, you know, with the budget committee on many different things. Uh, I will say they've been very pleased with our new report mechanism that we've presented to them with um, a different format. And I, I want to acknowledge that, you know, this is 
what we did as a board, the five of us. We came up with a new format that we delivered to the budget committee, which, you know, they didn't have a whole lot of questions. And, and the questions they've had, they've asked Stephen, Michelle, and myself, Rob, you know, Andrew, and Jim, we've all delivered the questions they needed. Um, you know, we have some additional questions that we have to answer next week regarding the teacher's contract that, you know, they asked about last night that Steve and Michelle will work on. But the the big feeling around the table is the 8% tax rate impact. And, you know, they keep circling that on their on, on the radar as opposed to the overall budget increase. And I've been trying to wrap my head around the best approach in order to deliver a follow-up next week to them for them to understand that you know as a board we have delivered a budget that meets the, you know the needs of the students while respecting the taxpayers on limited resources we are you know the the big factor is at the state level we are eight hundred thousand dollars short you know in order um that makes our tax rate eight percent you know I, i'm open to this board for giving me a recommendation to, to bring to the budget committee in order to make a, a case to why it's important that they um, approve the budget that we've we presented to them. Um, they know they know our fixed our fixed uh, costs that are required. You know they know everything that we put into this budget that made made it a required increase. I mean there's there's no fluff as discussed. It's basically last year's budget plus a couple of additional things that we needed for the district and IA, um, you know, cost of transportation, just other stuff. It's just lack of revenue. So I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about unpacking it a little bit for them to look at, you know, the cost of our operating account, you know, as a, it increased this to show them and that at the local level, we can't solve a loss that result at the state level. So, you know, that was the first thing that we, um, that's the first thing I can think of that they keep going going at is 8% on the tax rate. Well, for us as a board, we have been talking about the increase on the budget um, and with the bond. To be open, to, uh, you, they, there's been not a lot of questions about the budget. There was just standard questions. I mean, Steve, I mean, I don't know what else I've missed. I mean, they keep going back to the 8%. Um, we've answered every question. I've given them an opportunity you know, for anything that we could provide to them. And, um, you know, I'm open to this board if there's a way to unpack this so they can understand how important it is um, to pass this budget. Rob, did you, you took yourself off mute. I don't know if you, had, if you wanted to add something. I did. Um, so I, I was listening in last night to uh, sort of the summary piece where a lot of the budget committee had shared their thoughts with where they're at. And I agree with Norm that there's, there's a, you know, an emphasis on the 8%. And, but I think the emphasis is not on the 8% where they're saying you need to cut this because it's 8%. I think their concern is, can you pass a budget that shows an 8% increase? Um, and will people vote for it? So I think that, you know, part of our challenge as a board is to in a very clear, simple way, explain to the town um, as people go to vote why we have this increase that we have. You know, it's a different thing to say, you know, in your own household, well, you know, why did you spend an extra $40,000 this year? Well, unfortunately, you know, the, the furnace blew up and the well went bad and okay, it's understandable, those things happen. Um, and I think that that's going to be our challenge. And if that if we can show uh, folks in town, why we are where we are, um, without expecting people, you know, I, like the budget bulletin is good for those of us that are analyzing what happens and it's good for the budget committee, but the average voter is not going to go through that document. So I think our real challenge, and maybe, you know, this is something that we do through the finance committee, or we, we ask for some other folks to help us out with, is you know, to use the word market. How do we market this so that people can really understand and appreciate what we've got? You can get balled up in this eight percent number, um, you know. And I and I, I heard last night the words unsustainable. Well, nobody's saying we're going to have an eight percent increase every year for the next. You know, that that's not what we're saying, and that's not what the facts bear out. So, um, 
I think that's the challenge. And, and I, I, I understand their concerns, but I do think we're sort of, if we continue to focus on that number, we're not gonna solve the problem. The problem is how do we share the information so people can appreciate the situation we're in um, and that you know those year over year numbers are still pretty good. And I think you're right. We have to show data, you know, past years. I mean, we had a 25% on the tax assessment in town, which, you know, as we learn as a board, not everyone in town is going to be happy with what's, what's happened with that. Some people are. Some people had their house assessed higher, but their taxes went down. You know, the formula for it was, it was I'm sorry, got a flip flop. Their house went up and their, and their taxes stayed the same. You know, everyone was hit differently. So someone may be like, you know, my taxes went down 1500 and I stayed the same while another person's property went up, went up and they had to pay more. It, it, it's, it's a, it's a very complicated thing that, you know, I think some people don't understand. Um, trying to explain in public, you get a little confused sometimes, but my point is, is that, you know, we need to show year over year, over year increases and how it's affected by what's what happened in 2019. 25% is a lot. And, 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 that, and if you remember, that was a year a lot of people were upset about the increase, but it affected them. But you have to look at, you know, Rob, one thing I look at is last year we were at 2043, three cents difference from the previous year. And now we're going to 165. People have to understand the change and what's happened with revenue. They have to understand the assessment involved in there. And, and, and I agree with you, delivering that to the community clearer is a great point how to do it. I would love to love to find a way to do it and make it very clear and bring it Wednesday to them and say, this is how they can be, they can be, you know, the voters basically saying, Hey, this is what's happened. I think it's a great, great way. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, right. so I would just say, you know, I, I'm, the budget committee is probably reflecting the same conversation that we all had. At least I can speak for myself. Um, yeah. You know, we worked on this for a month and the 8% through all the courses of our conversation was what stuck out to us. So it's, it's not out of, out of the question that uh, obviously that would be what the budget committee is also looking at. And I, again, I can only speak for myself, but um, you know, I came around once, you know, we really dissected what are the drivers um, and then um, going back to like, how would we resolve that through budget reductions? Right. Cause that's what we're talking about. Like, how would we do that through the operating budget reductions? Um, and, you know, we went back and looked at, at what we considered last year is what would those budget reductions and I, for one, just it, after just talking for the last hour and a half about, you know, um, what we're, what, what we're going to see in terms of educational needs coming out of the pandemic to go and to make those reductions on that list would, um, it, the, the, it's hard to, ba you can't balance those two together because we, we have a need, um, so that's what got me there, um, you know, and it wasn't easy. Um, you know, an 8% budget increase is a lot and um, for all the reasons we already know. Um, but I, I do think, I mean, I think the presentation that we've done that, you know, um, that Rob has produced that one pager, I think is very good. Um, and in my mind, it's a question, um, there's the budget committee, which is they're gonna make their own decision on what, what needs to happen. I think they're informed, they understand, um, but they'll, I mean, I. We should explain it to them, but I don't have a, I don't, I, I don't operate thinking that they don't understand. I think they have a really good understanding of what's going on. Um, so I think they're just going to, have to make a decision on what you know what they want to put forward. I hope I hope they see um, the wisdom of what we've done. And then I, I just think it really is how do we um, take the conversation and bring it out to the community. Um, and I think we have the tools. It's really just do we have the forums in order to to be able to have a have a communication. Um, with people in town, that's that's two way and not a one way. Um, and I, I, I struggle with that, um, especially now because of, of where we're at. But I do think um, if we start planning for some informational sessions over and above what we need to do under whatever House Bill 1172 or whatever that process is, I, I think it would behoove us to think through some like public conversations that we want to have between the time the budget committee votes on the budget in early February and before those required ones that we need to have, having something in the middle there um, through February and early March would probably be, um, it, would probably, it, would, it would probably be good, especially if we can make them interactive so that 
um, as many people as possible could could see that information, ask us questions, and and understand, you know, what we're presenting. Um, th that's all I can come up with. It's not very good, but the only other open question, and I, I hope I wrote about it in board notes, but um, we had a, a legislative update recently at the school administrators. Uh, and there is some bipartisan support, understanding the gap that everybody's in because of the one-time right payment last year and the loss of enrollment and the adequacy. But that, um, you know, so there may be some relief from the state as Norm has talked about, this is a big revenue piece. I mean, it, it, there just, there is some bipartisan support for that. You know, we've talked about the finance committees. And, and I guess, and I guess, you know, I'm gonna agree with you, Jim, if I'm reading you correctly, sometimes it's a little tricky on Zoom is, We've done our job and we delivered a budget to them in a new format and every question that they've asked we've answered i dig deep i dug deep last night saying what else would you like from the board and the only thing that they wanted to, to discuss which we're going to be talking is um the next line item on this on the update here um they've had all the information we've answered all their questions um and i don't know what else I can do and maybe it's not a mat it's not a matter of maybe i'm overthinking it because you know i want what's best for this board you know i give it my all you all know that you know i represent all of us here um i guess i just i stand back you know stand back and wait for them to um ask more questions but i i guess i agree with jim you know we deliver maybe a better communication process once we get to get to the community to deliver this and we deliver what we could to the budget committee and go from there Steve, is there uh, any sense um, in the legislature when it, uh, the, 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 Senate, the Senate bill holding harmless on the adequacy aid is expedited? So it, it, it um, uh, according, is, according to Jay Kahn and, and that the Senator comment is going uh, quickly through the process to get relief um, before the before what's happening very soon, which is the deliberative sessions and you know, for SB2 towns as well as the annual meeting. So they did expedite it, Rob, and hopefully we'll get early returns. And I can check in in the next couple of days with Representative Bluno to see what the status is. Thanks. Well, I was just gonna jump jump in on this. You know, I think, I, I understand that for this budgeting, we wanted to really focus on what the operating budget is, but I actually think that there is a uh, real benefit in, in being upfront and saying, we are bringing you an 8% budget and it sucks. And it is, or an 8% 8, 8 tax increase and it sucks and it is unsustainable uh, and we hate it. And here's why we are bringing it to you. Um, I, I sometimes feel that acknowledging um, that this is crappy is helpful um, because we're not, <laughs> none of us, in a regular year would say, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna bring an 8% tax impact. That sounds like a great idea. Um, you know, I, I think that we have a unique set of circumstances that we've gone over several times, but I do think that there is benefit um, in naming it. I also, while I understand and have talked about as well, um, the impact of our state funding on the local level, you know, and I've said it before, we are 50 out of 50 in the United States. I often do not feel that that um, feels like an effective um, argument. You know, I think that it feels like passing the buck. Um, it can both be a reality and also not a good argument. Um, you know, it is a reality that we are all working in, um, but I, I don't think that it has as much of an impact as perhaps we would hope it would. And I think that naming what we are doing and what we are bringing and acknowledging that this is not awesome and then deep dive unpacking it is helpful. Um, I think that those, you know, showing the programmatic budget is helpful. I think to Rob's point, the year over year numbers, what the facts bear out, that's helpful um, because these are, these are things that we have some control over, even if it's very small, and that we within our community can express to one another. I just think that when we start talking state level, you know, I will continue talking to our legislators, um, but as a way to communicate why we're in the position that we're in, I find that it's a, a less persuasive argument. 
So those are just a couple other thoughts that I have as far as messaging and talking about the budget situation that we're in. And I agree with Andrea on that on, on the last point. I, I I think it's a point of it's a it's a fact and a point of reference on the state money. But I, I think you know you and I don't use the word excuse to mean that you know that's what we're doing. But I, I think sometimes people hear it that way. Um, and so I, I think acknowledging what it is and I, I think it's a fact. And um, we could talk about why that fact is. But um, I think we have to we could state it, but we then have to go over um, and explain because it, it's. You know, it's not going it, to, it, it may not resolve itself. And so um, that can't be what we rest on, which I, we haven't been. Um, but, but I think it is a fact and we have to move on. How definitive are we able to be that next year and the year after won't look like this? I mean, are we able to really identify this as a confluence of factors in a moment in time that we really don't think will continue? And can we be specific about that? to give people some confidence that this isn't the trajectory that they were, you know, the unsustainable argument. Do we have a way to say, yeah, this isn't sustainable and this isn't what it's going to be. I mean, are we in a position to do that? I don't know the facts well enough to know the answer to that. Well, I mean, Steve, you can, you can, I mean, if you just think about the drivers, you know, the retirement costs as a driver um, isn't, isn't something we're going to be seeing year to year. Um, that's not going to, right. That's a, that's a two year actuarial um, stable out there. So that's solid. Uh, um, this was the biggest increase because it was the biggest amount of the, of the facility project. We talked about that during the presentation, right? This is the end of one, the beginning of another, as opposed to just the end of round two. And I hate to say it, you know, I guess I, I, I don't think the whole will be as large, right? If, if, the, if the revenue is down with a visit, I don't think, well, I said that once and Mr. O'Brien said, no, Steve, it's going to be lower. So I won't say that, but I think the revenue police will be more stabilized, um, especially if enrollment goes up, which we expect. Um, you know, health insurance this year was 6.25. Um, that's, I think it's pretty close to, I mean, that's, it's not a bad year. Um, so we'll see how that does sometimes, you know, our drivers are typically health insurance, retirement, um, you know, the, you know, those are typically, in the, but the project will start to stabilize. So I think I got some advice from you, which I'll unpack with Michelle and Steve and maybe, maybe with yeah. Rob. I mean, I think, you know, we've, we've done our job. You know, and I think Andrea's right. I mean, this is reality. This is the budget. And this is why it's this way. And, and maybe, you know, part of what, what you and, and Rob and Steve on the finance committee can think about just is the, is the communication out to the community? Um, and and what, what sort of a, what you think a plan looks like that makes sense. And I'm not, my suggestion isn't that you and Rob and Steve have to do all the work, but um, but, you know, think about what the plan looks like and then, you know, we, we can figure out how we best accomplish, you know, some, some outreach and communication and engagement with, with different groups and audiences just because um, that's probably our, our best next step in terms of, of getting more input and getting more people understanding of, of sort of where we're at in the numbers. So um, I don't know if that's a task that you guys are willing love to take to. on, but that might, that might be a good next step. Would love to. Hey, we might have some community members who may want to help have some suggestions on communication plan. I, I'm happy to listen to that and and bring it to you, Rob and Steve and Michelle. Maybe there's something we can do to get the word out. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, Norm, you may mention to it. Uh, the next item um, is the uh, the town valuation um, in the budget process. Sure. So last night uh, when we were closing the meeting, um, there was a discussion in the meeting before about this and how the select board has one value and how the school board has another. So in closing last night, um, the select, they were discussing um, maybe the board using the select board's value in determining um, the overall tax rate impact. And I wasn't comfortable speaking to it or agreeing to anything until I spoke to Steve and Michelle because I don't have enough knowledge of why we use that, that rate and that specific number. So it was important for me to come back here before I vote on anything. And so with that, um, they agreed that we would have a discussion as a board and then come back to the 
budget committee next week and have a discussion. It, it makes sense for the board and the select board to have the same validation. I agree, but what number we use, I think is a discussion that needs to be discussed here and why we use this um, and go from there. Um, the select board has done a 1% increase overall on the um, valuation that we, we use. So it's like a $600,000 increase, $6 million increase about, if I'm doing my math in my head correctly. So just to let you guys know, um, that's, they were using that as a number in their budget. Um, I did ask them whether or not the town administrator agreed to that and they didn't give me any indication yet, um, which we're gonna find out because you know, as a board member, I've, I've said it last night, I always trust Michelle and Steven before I you know, say no to them, I wanna make sure that I'm able to say, hey, this is why I believe I'm saying no to them. So um, with that, you know, it's a discussion for us here to determine um, the best path forward and recommendation. So for us, um, the, the, tax, the, the tax rate was set in November. That's a valuation submitted by DRA on the form. And for schools already, we have two different valuations, one for the statewide education property tax which I think doesn't include utilities and, and something like that. So um, I have the form. Um, if you want to just share the screen real quick. Uh, can you see that? So the valuation, um, the 780, um, that's what we've used, right? And Michelle, that's what we've always used, that number. It's not arbitrary. It's not capricious. It's there. If, and if it goes up, then, then the ta this tax rate setting, the time goes down, you know, and um, and then this is the 749. That's the state education. That's the alternate one. So, um, to be completely frank, when we found out at the budget committee that the town was considering using a, a different valuation, which is an assumption that the value is going up, and certainly Neil and his team has a lot more knowledge of permits, right, and the number of new homes and, and the increase to the base. That's something Michelle and I don't get, um, but the it just is making that assumption that it's going up and to bake that in as, as a given, as opposed to something that happens, um, you know, a, a natural progression. Um, you know, I, Michelle will kick me virtually for now, but Michelle and I have talked a lot about this. We like to say we use the DRA 2020 tax rate breakdown valuation. It's defensible, it's, it's published, uh, it's consistent tracking. All of a sudden, this year we're going to use two percent. Next year we'll use one. What about the tracking? How do we follow it? Um, and I deep respect, as you all know, for Neil Cass and what the slight deep respect for that. But for us, we already have two evaluations. I would really hate to start explaining about why we adjusted it this year and not the past and lose historical record and a practice. But um, we serve at the pleasure of the board. Um, we'll advocate for whatever. Um, you know, you think is right. But from our standpoint, using this documented, printed, published you know, practice is what's best um, for estimating a tax rate based on a written document. Is that fair, Michelle? Absolutely. And um, so I think it only, it brings clarity to how, yeah, how you got at it. And, um, and honestly, all it does is it changes it to make it less. And some people might think that's funny that's being funny about it because of the fact that, you know, you really don't know and we don't. And so I would hate, and, and we've never had to do this, but in, in the time I've here, and I think it was even before, but we've never estimated what the tax rate was gonna be. And then we're, we're off in that it was gonna be more. But if we do some estimating and somehow something happens because construction's not, you know, we all know this, we've heard it because of COVID, you can't get things you used to be able to get on a timely manner and everything. Someone could have a fire before the date that, you know, the evaluations are done on. And I mean, there's too many things that can happen. Um, to me, it, it would be just giving a delivery of what's the worst case and then Hopefully it can be delivered better than that because of exactly that kind of a thing. That's where we are. You know, and this is when I was on a different board, this, this topic had come up often and at least the past experience has been, I, I think this, what Steve and Michelle just stated was um, the response and how the board uh, progressed. And 
So I, I, I tend to think that, um, I, well, I think that the town and the school should use the same number for valuation. Um, and we put forward a budget that uses what has historically and is defensible number based upon um, DRA. And so um, like as one member, I'm very comfortable with that. I think the budget committee, um, the budget committee's job is to, is to vote on a budget um, that will then go on a warrant. And I think if the budget committee feels that the valuation number should change to reflect a different number, the budget committee can make that determination and put a budget number forward. And then the, this board um, can decide if, if that number is acceptable to us or if we want to put forward an alternate to that in the warrant. And so I, I, I appreciate the budget committee wanting input into it, but we've presented them with a budget um, that uses evaluation and you know, the budget committee needs to make their own determination. In my view, they need to make their own determination of how they settle evaluation that the town has put forward and the school district has put forward. Um, I, we can defend ours. Um, we just did. Steve and Michelle just gave the defense of where the number comes from and how you trace it back and what it means. Um, the budget committee, I think, needs to have a determination if they can do the same case for what the town put forward. Um, I don't feel that that's our responsibility to have to, um, to, have to defend a different evaluation um, that, that the town's putting forward. It's, it's not our decision, in my view, to make. It's, if the budget committee wants to do it, then it's in their right to go forward. But Anyway, that's where I land. I, I, I think a change of the valuation, the way they're presenting it, makes our budget look a little better. Um, but I, again, I'm not sure that, right now, I don't think it's ours to defend because right now we can defend what we put forward because it's, it's historically, um, and we could trace it to DRA. So anyway, that was a long soliloquy, sorry. No, I agree with you, Jim. You know, when the voter votes and they're seeing what they're voting for a tax impact, I want to be able to have something, a document saying, hey, this is what we're going by. I don't want to, I mean, and that was for me when I asked them last night, the risk factor. And they had said, you know, it could fluctuate this or that. But again, you know, I didn't have enough, enough knowledge until I saw this document where to me, you know, as a controller, I look at a paper trail and I go back and I look at that and I'm like, okay, this is why I made a decision in my, in my presentation to a board I have a number that's not going to change that I can fall back on. So with that, it, I would I would agree with Jim. I would leave it alone. If the budget committee wants to produce a new number and bring it to us to discuss, happy to look at it. But I, I, I support I support what they had to say. I was just going to ask a quick question. Is um, did the town put forward the algorithm or the metrics as to how they came up with that number? Like specific, or did they just say, you know, based on building permits, we project, I mean, was there any math that was done here? And Yeah, so they, they used, and that was a good question that Mr. Zankel brought up last night, that they had, a, I believe it was, a, it was a total of, I think, 15 building permits and it ended up being like a total of 525,000, which the average house that they were talking about was 300,000. So there's a big gap in the math that they were that they were talking about in the meeting, because there's no way 15 houses at 525 is um, really, I mean, it's nice, but I mean, I don't, I don't see that being an accurate number. Um, I don't want to guess, you know, I want to, want to, I want to be, I don't want to guess either. I'm just curious about yeah. how it you know, that's that's what I was told. And that's why I wanted to ask Neil, you know, I, 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 he's a town administrator. He knows more data collected than, than I do. But again, I work with Michelle and Steve on this part. So. So, Steve, simply put, school districts across the state use your model to come up with their valuation to set the tax rate. Yep. Okay. Never heard of anybody messing with evaluation that's changed anticipating. Never heard of it. Seems like, a no, yeah. seems like a no-brainer to me. Thank you. I think that's uh, that's the goal of this item. We've got a, a good discussion. Norm has his marching orders, and we'll, uh, I appreciate it. So thank you for this time. Andrew or Seth, before we leave it, do you guys have any any thoughts? Anything different, I guess? No. Okay. Can you just make sure that we bring that document to the next Wednesday so we can just show that paper trail, um, Michelle, budget committee? Okay, 
That'd be great. Sure, I'll send it to you if you'd like. Love to. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, I lost my agenda. Building no. committee update. There we go. That was easy. Thanks, Steve. Building committee update. Yeah, Norm, I think. Brian. Yeah, real, real quick. I, I want to give a, a quick shout out to Bill. Um, he gave me a tour of Harold Martin, and I must say, it's beautiful. You know, it, it's you walk in there, you're not looking at a blueprint anymore. You're in it. And I got to say, everyone is doing great. I'm very pleased with what's going on. Um, and thank you for his time for doing that. Real quick update on the building committee. Uh, at our last meeting, we discussed adults. Steve and his team are working on a recommendation that they'll be bringing forward um, to move forward in the next month or so where I'll bring to the board to let you know what their recommendations are for us to discuss. But um, that's the next big big part of the project is to kind of look at that while we move, th move through um, construction and other adults. So. It's his team deciding what's best for their schools, telling us how they can use um, these additional funds to affect and help our students. And yeah, it'll be coming for board action, I hope in uh, early February. Perfect. Any questions for Norm or Steve? All right, um, so next up, uh, Steve, you, had, you had talked about this earlier in the meeting, but uh, the custodian night supervisor. Yeah, um, this uh, is an open position. Um, we're pleased to bring Mr. Ontario forward. Uh, and so it's an action item tonight. Any questions uh, for Steve? Or um, this is an action item, so um, is everybody all set with it? Perfect. All right, and uh, next up are financials uh, for quarterly and monthly, so Michelle. Sure. Um, so in the packet was uh, two uh, big, well, one big document and one smaller document. Um, but um, one thing I just want to point out a little bit because, um, you know, you might look at the, um, un, you know, the balance of our fund balance at the end of the year, what I'm predicting as of December 31st. Um, when this, when this was done, this report, I had already um, reclassed the items from the grants that we did get. Um, into the grants. So part of why we have what we have for a fund balance is because the money that the board uh, gratefully set aside for certain purchases, technology related and PPE, we haven't had to use yet uh, for the most part, some, but not for, you know, in the scheme of things. Um, so that is part of why um, the balance is so high. I just bring it up because um, we, we do have a fluky year and, uh, you know, being that we're in COVID and we carried forward money. And so it's an abnormal year. Um, so I just uh, throw caution in the wind for people that are just looking at this, thinking that it should all go, you know, to reduce the taxes because as, as we've talked about before in the budget process, every time you can't meet it the following year, then that's automatically a tax rate increase. Um, and so I just thought that was important too to point out because you know people will look at this document in comparison to the budget. Um, it's just something to be mindful of. Um, and the hope would be that if we are going in the way we are, that you know maybe the board could you know if we get the five percent sock as much as we can um, to that, um, and by then we'll know about what we're getting from the state. Um, and then, you know, we'll be able to figure that out. You know, do we need to encumber money because of services on top of what we're going to get from the state? So I guess those are just new things that I'm starting to think about um, to, to make sure that people start thinking about and um, just because uh, it is a lot of information and um, what we want to do is, is do the best thing, which is um, deliver a tax rate as low as we can um, without being too aggressive on things. Um, to potentially cause issues in the future. I had just one question. Um, and look at the unreserved fund balance. Um, when we offered early retirement to our, um, to our, to the two additional teachers, did that, or does that encumber it already and put somewhere else, or is that still in there until um, it's taken? No, um, because early inclination is, is that we will not have five that will take it. Early inclinations are there will be hope, you know, I don't want to say hopefully, but like, you know, we, we factored in three 
And so when we did the budget for next year, we factored in that three people would. Um, and so um, that is what is encumbered right now is the three. We would have done it if we had information that led us to more realistic that it was gonna happen to be four or five, we definitely would have that money encumbered. Okay, so we the other two offerings are in that balance then since? So we, we don't budget for it. So yeah. we never took it out. So like for okay. instance, three people have been in ever since they, um, ever since the retirements have been uh, put in, we had to pick three and we okay. picked the, the three most realistic ones, um, not knowing at the time that the board would entertain five. And um, so if I knew that all five were definitely, you know, 90 plus um, gonna take it, I would have already had those other two encumbered, but I don't. But we yeah. didn't have the money anyways. We have a little bit of money left in those areas because we didn't spend as much as we had budgeted. Um, but um, I hope that was helpful. No, it makes sense. That's what I want to know. Thank you so much. And I think the definitive date is March 1st. Um, and I, I think I did update the board and board notes about um, one decision that has been made. Did I do put that in board notes? I thank you. Thank you. I read a lot, so thank you, Andrew. Any other questions uh, or, or thoughts for Michelle? Michelle, thank you for that. That was a good explanation too. Um, all right, so uh, that is the end of our, um, I guess, of our agenda items. And so that brings us to the uh, second public comment portion of the meeting. And so uh, for those um, of you who have stuck with us this long um, and uh, have public comments that you'd like to make, I just ask uh, to click the raise your hand button towards the bottom of your screen. Um, and then we will call you in order. And if you could just um, give your name and address and try to keep your comments to about three minutes, that would be uh, fantastic, appreciate it. So first up is Candy Garvin. Hello, my friends. Hello, Candy. We're all breathing a little easier, I think, since a couple days ago. And I want to thank you. I watched the budget meeting last night too, right, Norm? And yeah, it was a really good meeting. You have done an excellent job with this budget. You did what you said you were going to do. It's detailed enough that even a non-numbers person like me can, can understand most of it. And I appreciate that. The thing that I'm going to do next is be the devil's advocate. Of course, people are going to look at 8% high. That's normal, isn't it? You don't want to just bring the sheep to the pen. You have educated, and you know what? I know you'll educate the people who need to be educated when we do the Zoom meetings before the, the vote. I know that. You are really good at it. Um, my suggestion is that you, you just take a couple breaths and realize that your hard work is work that has been done. You know your mission. And the people in town who have to pay the taxes, you're going to hear it over and over. I might as well be the first one, whether I believe that or not. They're going to, we're going to say, we can't do this. Part of it could be the, the pandemic, the end of the pandemic. Uh, parents want their kids back in school 100% when it's not quite safe yet, people. It's not quite safe. Just again, take a couple breaths about it. Uh, the kids will catch up. They're much smarter than we are in a lot of ways. Um, and as you heard Amy say, a lot of their skill set has grown in ways that they would not have imagined it. Um, they want to be with their friends. You know, through growth and de development, that's really what they want. That's what they really, really want. And it will be so very soon. I just don't want you to get so discouraged if you know what I'm going to say, right? 
if it does not pass, you've done a great job. I, I, I believed in you, not that that matters, but it, it is a good thing. The teachers needed a raise. They needed a raise. You'll hear about um, the insurance costs and people will say, well, why did you only get the new hires? You know, and you know the reasons why you did that and you can explain that. It's, it's, it's not geometry or physics or calculus. It's just, you've been right above board with us. Don't be discouraged, all right? Pinky swear? Okay, you take care. Steve, I've never seen you look so relaxed. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's something in the timing, Candace. Yes, I know, I know, I know. Um, good luck, right. we'll, we'll be okay. And you only live in Bow. It's not like we won't see you ever again. <laughs> Talk to you later. Thank you for taking my call. I'm going to watch Mr. Mayor now. Thank you, Candy. Have Bye. a good night. Uh, so next hand up is um, Emily Gula. Hi, I'm Emily Gula, 169 Spring Street. I just want to thank everybody on the board and teachers and leadership team. We appreciate all you're doing. I know you're working extremely hard. Uh, and I was glad to hear the comments from Mr. Carroza. My two students are at Harold Martin about the uh, planning to really make the most of the instructional time that's available. And I just encourage you to think about how maybe you can restructure parts of the schedule to prioritize that literacy instruction, because I think a benefit of remote learning has been four days of what uh, known as foundations or that beginning reading letter names and sound instruction. They can get, um, my students are getting that every day, so 20 to 30 minutes a day. When we return to hybrid, that means two days of that instead of four. So thinking about how creatively on those days of hybrid that you could potentially double up on that early reading instruction just to keep kids moving at the pace that they have been able to do while in remote. Thanks. Wonderful, Emily, thank you for your comments. And we'll pass that along to, I'm sure, I'm sure Mr. Crows is listening, but we'll pass it along. Um, next hand is uh, Sarah Matson Dustin. Hi, everybody. Good evening. This is Sarah Matson Dustin. I'm at 517 Dustin Road. I am in the camp of being really worried about my kindergartner and about literacy in particular. So I really appreciated the discussion tonight uh, about increased flexibility in the decision making matrix. Um, also appreciate the comments that Emily Gula just made about really trying to come up with creative ways to get kids a little bit more literacy instruction. Uh, so the matrix is one of the foundational documents that we have. The other is the health and safety MOA. And I really encourage you to think of the MOA as also being a document that can respond to conditions as they change, uh, like the matrix does, and not one that we have to wait to change until we have every piece of information that we might like to have. We don't know how phase 1B of the vaccine rollout is going to go. It starts next week. We don't know exactly when uh, the vaccine supply is going to become more robust. Uh, but we don't want to wait until we have every bit of that information to determine how we're going to change in response to it. Because if we do that, we're going to lose really precious time. And I think we teach kids about sense of urgency. And I really feel like we need a sense of urgency around this. We lost a couple weeks in the fall uh, because we had to wait for a budget to pass. The idea that we might lose even two, three, four weeks because we haven't gotten ahead of renegotiating the MOA, I, I think is really um, an unacceptable outcome. I am thrilled that teachers have the extraordinary privilege of being able to have access to an extremely scarce and valuable resource. It cannot be that that privilege does not mean that kids who have made really significant sacrifices for going on a year now, that something doesn't change for them too. They are in an early phase so that we can get kids back to school. And I totally agree with you. We don't know if that's going to be March 15th, April 1st, May 15th, 
Um, but I think it's time to start having the conversation about what does a critical mass of vaccinated teachers get us? Is it three feet of distance so that kids can come back every day and we keep the masks on? Great. Um, is it something else? I, I, I don't even know what the other ideas might be, but uh, I am all for continuing to follow public health guidance. Um, but I just, I see this, um, this vaccination of our district staff as being a just transformative event that I really hope we can be prepared to, to the second we hit the condition that makes it safe for more kids to be in school. We don't wanna be talking about it, we wanna be doing it. So I hope you'll take that into consideration. Thanks. Thanks Sarah for your comments. Um, I don't believe we have any, any more hands up. Um, oh, I take that back, we do. Uh, Mr. Chris Taylor. Hi, Chris, thanks for joining. Hi, good evening, can you hear me okay? Yeah, loud and clear. Good, thank you. Chris Taylor here uh, in new to town, uh, Clement Hill. Uh, one of the, uh, you know, appreciate the discussion tonight, all the information in regards to the different models. Uh, my student would be over at Harold Martin, uh, being a second grader. Uh, one of the pieces of information, I guess, would be good to clarify uh, in regards to the models. Uh, if they do go back to our hybrid model, um, is there still the option for full remote uh, in the event you know, for families with um, health concerns through the family? You know, until we get further down, who knows what the vaccination status is going to be? Um, but will we, are we going to have that option for full remote? You know, in that in that event yeah thanks chris it's a good question um i think the short answer is yes that there's there will remain a um a full remote full remote model um for those families who choose to do so as we've been doing um you know since uh uh september so that that, that option will still be available okay excellent. that's a great option and you know hopefully we can all get back safely and uh I'll give the kids back to some sort of uh interaction with their peers again uh, I'm with you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so for, much. Uh, taking a moment. Have a good night. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Um, so uh, the only hand we have up right now is Emily Gula, and and I don't know Emily if that's because you haven't um, put your hand down or if you have another comment. So I'll give you. Oh, you took your hand down, so um, I know the answer. Thank you. Um, so next hand that did come up is uh, Jen. Hi, I just wanted to state that I agree with um, Sarah Metz and Dustin. This is Jen Blogger of 716 Option Road again. Um, I, I do think that we need to start looking at that MOA sooner rather than later. Um, and I thought Norm had a good point that in 1B, there are some teachers that will be qualifying to um, get vaccinated sooner rather than later um, and will be able to get vaccinated in phase 1B. Um, so I do think it's worth looking at that soon um, for all the reasons Sarah stated. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands up. And so um, at this point, I will close the public uh, comment um, agenda item, and, and um, I don't think this needs to be said, but I'll just say it. Um, you know, all of our emails um, are available on the website, um, on, the, on the district website. And so um, people normally aren't shy, but I would just invite people who, who have comments they, they um, want to make to feel free to email the board um, your comments, and, and we do read them all. So um, appreciate that. And so um, I would ask under, we're going under action items. I would ask if there's a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to adopt a revised FY22 total operating budget value of $21,732,059. I moved. Robbie, okay. on mute. Second. There we go. <laughs> Is there well, any I discussion? I think Dorm got second too. No, sorry. No, <laughs> no discussion. All right, um, not hearing any, uh, Rob. Uh, Rob Nato, yes. Andrea? Andrew Folsom, yes. Norm? Norm Guppel, yes. Seth? That's a frame, yes. And Jim O'Brien is yes. Uh, so that passes 5 0. Yeah. Um, so is there a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to approve the March 20th warrant article number five to read as follows? 
Article five, to see if the school district will vote to authorize indefinitely until rescinded to retain year end unassigned general funds in an amount not to exceed in any fiscal year, 5% of the current fiscal year's net assessment in accordance with RSA 198 colon four B Roman two. The majority vote is required. Moved. Second. Any discussion? And this is consistent with uh, wording from DRA, correct? All right. Um, Rob? Uh, Rob Nato, yes. Andrea? Andrea Folsom, yes. Norm? Norm Gupal, yes. Seth? The state frame, yes. And Jim O'Brien is a yes. So that motion passed 5 0. Um, is there a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to accept the superintendent's nomination of James Terrio, custodian night supervisor? pending final approval of the superintendent start date to be determined by the superintendent. So moved and welcome. Welcome. Second. Second. There we go. <laughs> Any discussion? Um, Rob? Rob Nato, yes. Andrea? Andrea Folsom, yes. Norm? Norm Google, yes. Seth? Seth A. Fran, yes. And Jim O'Brien is a yes. And so that passes 5-0. So we do have a need for non-public, but before I ask for a motion on that, is there anything, um, any other items any board member wants to bring up before we go into non-public? All right, and so I would ask for a motion to, for the board to go into non-public session um, for the discussion of matters as per RSA 91A colon three, Roman two. And we would have um, sessions on A for personnel and C for reputation. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right. Um, so Rob? Rob Nato, yes. Andrea? Andrea Folsom, yes. Rob, uh, sorry, Norm. Rob already went. Norm Google, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Seth? Seth A. Frame, yes. Um, and Jim O'Brien is a yes. And so the board will be going into non-public to discuss uh, those matters. Um, I will, for the board, I will send you in just a second, um, a link for the non-public. And so um, when we adjourn here, we can just go on. Um, Jim, follow that link. Yes, Steve, I'd like you to join us. Um, all right, with that, um, thank you all. And thanks for everybody who attended tonight. Um, this is a good discussion, I really appreciate it. And we'll see everybody in two weeks. Thanks, Juliet and Mia. Uh, Have yeah, a good night. Yeah.